hearing will come to order. If the sea of cameras could separate so we can actually see our witness, that'd be appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> so there he is. Great. Um, <clears throat> uh, Director Lou, uh, welcome back. I understand there's a traffic problem and that tied you up and uh, those things can happen. Um, the president is fortunate that you agreed to a return assignment at OMB. Um, this one's going to be a little different than the last one, I think, because the fiscal situation is so much worse. Um, you've come under a darkening fiscal outlook. Uh, we are aware of the challenges that you face in putting this budget together, and we thank you for your hard work and for coming here today. Um, having said all of that, uh, the budget uh, of the United States is more than just about arithmetic. Um, it is a statement of national priorities. Uh, it is a gauge of our national health. Uh, because we face a crippling burden of debt, this year's budget in particular presented the president with a unique opportunity to lead our country. The president has disappointed us all by declining that opportunity. He punted. Instead of confronting our debt head on, the president has presented us with a budget that spends too much, borrows too much, and taxes too much, and that costs jobs and opportunities. His budget would double the amount of debt held by the public by the end of his term and triple it on the 10th anniversary of his inauguration. To be sure, our country was already on an unsustainable fiscal trajectory before he took office. Our debt is the product of acts by many presidents and many Congresses over many years. Both of our political parties share the blame uh, in where we've come to. Nevertheless, the president's policies have accelerated us down this disastrous path. He has made our spending problems worse with policies such as the failed stimulus and a brand new open-ended health care entitlement. He has argued for massive tax increases that would stifle economic growth and job creation and make our fiscal picture worse. His budget alone contains $1.6 trillion in higher taxes on American families, businesses, and entrepreneurs. In our nation's most pressing fiscal challenges, the president has abdicated his leadership role. First, he punted to a bipartisan fiscal commission to develop solutions to the problem. Then, when his own commission put forward a set of fundamental entitlement and tax reforms, a commission comprised of a majority of Democrats, he ignored them. He even failed to take the commission's advice on less sensitive subjects such as discretionary spending. His budget would increase discretionary spending by $353 billion relative to his commission's proposals. Uh, former Clinton chief of staff and co-chair of the Fiscal Commission, a man who I have great respect for, a Democrat, Erskine Bowles said, quote, the budget goes nowhere near where they, will, where they will have to go to resolve our fiscal nightmare. The president's budget disregards the drivers of our debt crisis and the insolvency of our entitlement programs. Every day that passes without leadership on this crucial challenge is another day of uncertainty for job creators and a darkening economic prospect for millions of Americans living in the shadow of our growing and unsustainable debt. The politically, res the politically safe response, I suppose, is to do nothing. I wonder about that, though. Unfortunately, this is the path the president has chosen. We feel that it is our responsibility to do things differently, to lead where he has fallen short, and that is exactly what we plan to do. With that, I will yield to Ranking Member Van Hollen for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Ryan. Uh, welcome, uh, Director Lou. I know that President Obama, uh, like President Clinton, will be well served by having you at the helm of uh, OMB. And I thank you for being here to discuss the President's budget. And while we're still reviewing some of the details, I want to commend the President uh, for putting forth a budget that reduces our deficit while also investing in our future. This is a tough love budget. It cuts non-security discretionary spending by $400 billion, taking that category of spending to the lowest share of GDP since the Eisenhower administration. And starting this year, it steadily decrease decreases the deficit and brings the budget to primary balance by the year 2017. But the President's budget cuts the deficit while making critical investments in areas like education, clean energy, infrastructure, and scientific innovation. Last week, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, uh, testified before this committee about the importance of targeted national investments to help grow the economy and keep America competitive. He highlighted the need to pursue policies to fo foster economic growth, quote, by encouraging investment in the skills of our workforce as well as new machinery and equipment, 
by promoting research and development, and by providing necessary public infrastructure. This budget does that. As we debate the best way forward, our conversation must include a comprehensive review of our national balance sheet. It is simply short-sighted to think we can try to balance our budget through cuts in domestic discretionary spending alone, a category that represents only 12 percent of the overall budget. We must look to other areas, including comprehensive tax reform and eliminating special interest breaks in the tax code. The President's budget moves in the right direction by putting an end to taxpayer dollars going to subsidies for big oil companies at a time when gas is costing American families more than $3 a gallon and oil companies are making huge profits. There's no reason to subsidize those companies and shortchange investments in education and Head Start uh, as some of our colleagues are proposing to do today on the floor of the House. This budget uh, extends tax cuts for middle class tax families, but rejects uh, tax breaks for those at the very uh, top. It takes a balanced approach, uh, much like the budgets under President Clinton. Under the Clinton administration, the country enjoyed real economic growth of 3.9 percent per year, and the economy added 20.8 million private sector jobs. That balanced approach allowed us to not only stop running deficits, but actually achieve surpluses and begin to reduce our nation's debt. Unfortunately, those surpluses disappeared under the previous Bush administration. They cut taxes for the wealthy and turned a $5.6 trillion surplus into a sea of deficits, lost 653,000 private sector jobs over that eight-year period. In January of 2009, when the President raised his hand and was sworn in, he was handed an economy in free fall that was losing 700,000 jobs a month and a record $1.3 trillion deficit. Unfortunately, some of the first acts of the new Congress were to eliminate the PAYGO rule and add $230 billion to that deficit in connection with health care reform. Having spent the first two years uh, working to rescue the economy, working with Congress uh, and the American people, the President's budget is now focused on strengthening the economy with a plan of targeted investments and deficit reduction. It stands in stark contrast, I might say, to uh, the approach that we're seeing uh, by our colleagues on the floor of the House, which is to slash important programs immediately, disregarding the impact on the fragile economy and workers. It is critical that our nation's budget strike the right balance with both spending and revenue, and I believe the President's budget makes an important effort to hit the right note. It is a starting point. Uh, I, I must say uh, it's interesting to hear many of our colleagues on the Republican side uh, criticize uh, the President for uh, not putting more of the ideas of the bipartisan deficit and debt reduction commission on the table when in the House uh, the representatives to that commission uh, voted against it. That being said, and I'm going to conclude, Mr. Chairman, in order to tackle our longer-term fiscal challenges beyond the 10-year period of this budget, it is important that, while, that the White House and the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, come together to seriously discuss and consider the ideas in the Commission's proposal. Compromise is not a dirty word. Getting things done requires give and take. We should begin that conversation now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lou, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, bring the mic close to your, to your, yeah, it's tough to get good sound out of that thing. So bring it really close to you if you could and hold the button down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, Ranking Member Van Hollen, uh, members of the committee, thanks for having me here today uh, to present the President's 2012 budget. It's uh, a real honor to be here again after 10 years presenting the President's budget. And I thank the chairman and the ranking member for the very kind personal words uh, that they opened with. I have a great deal of respect for each of them and look forward to working together in a bipartisan way as we move through what will be a long and difficult process. After emerging from the worst recession in generations, uh, we face another historic challenge. Uh, we need to demonstrate to the American people that we can live within our means and invest in the future. We need to work our way out of the deficits that are driving up our debt and at the same time make the tough choices uh, to make sure that we're in a position to out-educate, out-build, and out-innovate our competitors. That's what it's going to take to return uh, to robust economic health and to grow jobs in the future. 
This is the seventh budget that I've worked on at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, and the most difficult. It includes more than a trillion dollars in deficit reduction, two-thirds of it from lower spending, and it puts the nation on a path towards fiscal sustainability so that by the middle of the decade, the government will no longer be adding to our national debt as a share of the economy. By the middle of the decade, we'll be able to pay our current bills and remain in primary balance for many years after that. The President has called this budget a down payment because we still have work to do to pay down the debt and address our long-term challenges. But we can't start to pay down the debt until we stop, stop adding to it. And that's what this budget does. The budget lays out a strategy for significant deficit reduction, the most deficit reduction in a comparable period since the end of World War II. It will bring our deficit down to about 3% of the economy by the middle of the decade and stay there for the rest of this budget window. Changing the trajectory of our fiscal path is a significant accomplishment, but to do this it will take tough choices, and I'd like to highlight just a few of them. Our budget includes a five-year non-security discretionary spending freeze that will reduce the deficit by over $400 billion over the next decade and bring spending in this category of the budget to the lowest level since President Eisenhower sat in the Oval Office. To achieve savings of this magnitude, it's not enough to just deal with programs that are outdated or ineffective or duplicative, though we do start there. It's also necessary to make reductions in programs that absent the current fiscal situation, we wouldn't be looking for reductions. Programs like low-income energy assistance and community development block grants. In national security, which we're not freezing, we're also making real cuts. Defense spending over the past decade has been growing faster than inflation and we can no longer afford that. The budget cut $78 billion from the Pentagon's spending plan over the next five years, which will bring defense spending down to zero real growth. It cuts weapon programs that Secretary Gates and the military leadership say we don't need and we can't afford. We're also capturing savings that come from bringing our troops home from Iraq, which when you add it in brings defense spending down by more than 5% compared to the President's budget last year. Of course, cutting discretionary spending alone can't solve our fiscal problems. This budget also deals with mandatory spending and with revenue and it takes significant steps to address our long-term fiscal challenges. For example, this budget shows that we can pay for solutions to two problems that we've been all too willing to kick down the road by putting on the national credit card. One is preventing a nearly 30% reduction in reimbursements to doctors in Medicare to keep doctors in the system and treating patients. Another is preventing an increase in taxes on middle-class families through the alternative minimum tax, commonly known as the AMT. In December, there was bipartisan agreement to pay for a one-year extension of the so-called doc fix, uh, which was not required by budget rules, but it was the right thing to do. In this budget, we build on that, and we have $62 billion of savings to pay for the next two years of this fix. And that three years of paying for the doc fix establishes a clear pattern and creates a window so that we can work together so that we can address this in the future without adding to the deficit. With regard to the alternative minimum tax, uh, we have offsets in the budget to pay for three years of what's called a patch, and we would pay for it by limiting the amount that those in the highest tax bracket can receive for itemized deductions. It's a big step towards cutting back on spending in the tax code, and it's consistent with the Fiscal Commission recommendations. If we continue on this path of paying for the AMT patch after 2014, it alone will reduce the deficit by 1% of GDP by the end of the decade. These both are down payments on long-term reform to reduce the deficit further, and the administration looks forward to working with Congress to permanently cover these costs once and for all. Similarly, as the President said in the State of the Union, uh, we are eager to work together on a deficit-neutral corporate tax reform that will simplify the system, eliminate special interest loopholes, and level the playing field and lower the corporate tax rate for the first time in 25 years. And while it does not contribute to our deficits in the short or medium term, the President has laid out his principles to strengthen Social Security and has called on Congress to work on a bipartisan fashion to keep this compact with future generations. As we take these steps to live within our means, uh, we also invest in the areas critical to future economic growth and job creation. 
education, innovation, clean energy, and infrastructure. And even in these areas, the budget cuts programs in order to fund high priority investments. For example, in education, we maintain the increased maximum Pell Grant level, which is enabling nine million students to pay for college education. And we pay for it with $100 billion in savings that primarily come from eliminating summer school Pell Grants and eliminating a graduate student in-school loan subsidy. In the area of innovation, we support $148 billion in research and development investments, including $32 billion for the National Institutes of Health, and we need visionary goals to bring about a new clean energy economy to help pay for these investments. Lower priority programs are cut, and we eliminate 12 tax breaks for oil, gas, and coal companies that will raise $46 billion over 10 years. And to build the infrastructure we need to compete, the budget includes a proposal for a $556 billion surface transportation reauthorization bill. Not only does this plan include the consolidation of 60 duplicative, often earmarked programs into five, uh, and it demands more competition for funds, but we insist that the bill be paid for, and we look forward to working in a bipartisan manner to do that. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am under no illusions uh, how difficult it is to make the tough choices needed to put us on a sustainable fiscal path. As we make these choices, I believe that it's important that we not cut areas that are critical to helping our economy to grow and making a difference for families and businesses. Finally, cutting spending and cutting our deficits requires us to put political differences aside and working together. I look forward to working with you and crafting a set of policies that enable us to live within our means and invest in the future. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Liu, before I get into this, uh, how long do we have you for? I understand you have to testify over in the Senate later this afternoon. Um, I believe we have uh, till 1230. But a little bit longer than that since you were a little late. How's that sound? <laughs> you just need to eat lunch, right? Uh, I apologize for being late. No, no, I, I hadn't allowed for the new security to rules. <laughs> manage time so everybody gets a shot at, at their questions. Um, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they cut to the motion. Did you take the? Do you think the OMB director took the metro? Um, <laughs> Actually, the, the, the Mr. Chairman, the issue was the gentleman in front of me in line had to take his shoes off as he went through the metal yeah, detector, yeah. and it took a few minutes. <laughs> um, okay. I'm reading in the Washington Post today an editorial board, which is, you know, more often thought is favorable toward the administration's point of view. Quote: The title of the editorial is "President Obama's Budget Kicks the Hard Choices Further Down the Road." Quote, the president punted. Having been given the chance, the cover and the push by the fiscal commission he created to take bold steps to raise revenue and curb entitlement spending, President Obama, in his fiscal 2012 budget proposal, chose instead to duck. To duck and to mask some of the ducking with the sort of budgetary gimmicks he once derided. Uh, we just heard from the CBO director and the chairman of the Federal Reserve, one of the best things we could do for the economy today is put in place a plan that gets this deficit and debt under control. Why did you duck? I mean, why? <laughs> Look, if, if George Bush brought this budget to the House, I would say the exact same thing. You know the drivers of our debt. You understand the issues. I think the fact that the President even gave us this fiscal commission to, to start with, acknowledged we agree on the size and the scope and the nature of the problem. Why did you duck? Why are you not taking this opportunity to lead? Mr. Chairman, um, I think the President's budget, if you look at the bottom line, uh, addresses the fiscal challenges that we face in the short and the medium term. And he's called it a down payment, acknowledging that we need to work together in the long term. If you look at what the mandate of the Fiscal Commission was, it was to bring the deficit down to 3 percent of GDP uh, by the middle of the decade. Our budget does that. Surely there are things in our budget that we will have disagreements about. I know that we're going to have a serious debate about priorities, but the President's budget accomplishes the goal. And I think if you look at the budget, it does it with some very, very tough decisions. The spending reductions are very real. The revenue provisions are very real. The mandatory savings are very real. There are certainly other things that we'll, we'll need to work on together to address the long-term challenges. But if our goal is to get to a sustainable deficit by 2015, I think the President's budget puts down a comprehensive deficit reduction path. Okay, using your own table, S4, on page 176 of your budget, you don't get the primary balance in your own numbers until 2017, 
and then immediately thereafter you go, you know, you, you have more problems. So, so l l let's look at S4. If you look at S4, where it starts is a, the deficit is 10.9% of GDP. It comes down to 3.2% of GDP in 2015. Um, we then stay between 2.9, 3.2, 3.3, in that area around 3% of GDP for the rest of the decade, and if you had a series that went beyond, it would go on for years beyond that. Um, I, I think that it's a mistake to think of 3% of GDP as a bullseye. I think if you compare 10.9% to 3.2 or 3.1 or 3.0, it's a world of difference. So let's and I think we achieve primary balance in this budget. So let's get into what's behind that primary balance or behind your claims of, of, of balance. Um, and I can go th through the tables, but you're, am I correct that the budget proposes revenues that are $819 billion greater than your current policy baseline and that within your policy baseline you have an $807 billion 10-year tax increase built into it because it assumes the expiration of the 01 and 03 tax cuts uh, for higher income earners and assumes the estate tax reverts back to to the 2009 level. Am I correct that that is what your baseline assumes? Mr. Chairman, our baseline assumes, uh, consistent with the, the where there was bipartisan agreement in December, that we would permanently extend the middle class tax cuts and uh, that we would have estate tax relief. We did not have long-term agreement right. on the upper income rates or on the richer uh, estate tax provisions. I just want to make sure we have an equal yeah. understanding. We tried to construct a baseline so that the difference would be clear. So adding the the additions and the baseline revenue increases, that's about $1.6 trillion in additional revenues from where we are today, correct? Um, well, the upper income tax cut is $709 billion, and the uh, state provision is 98, and then there's some debt service on top of that. Right, so yeah. 1.6, okay. Um, it's 953, actually, I believe, but. Did, what, what about debt service? Uh, it's 709 for the upper income, 98 for the estate, and 147 in debt service. So. Let me get to this, because I want to, because you have to go, and I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to send you more. Your economic assumptions, which is how you achieve primary balance, which is how you, you, you achieve the claims you're making, uh, I want to walk you through this and ask you why you make these economic assumptions. Um, you're expecting very robust growth in the coming years. Uh, your forecast calls for real GDP growth well above 4% in 2013 and 2014, much, much higher than the private sector blue chip consensus or CBO. Um, but I find it interesting that 2013 also marks the year where we have, where you're calling for a, a big rise in taxes across all segments of our economy. Um, you basically are raising taxes on successful small businesses, on investment, uh, as part of the expiration of the 0103 tax cuts and the healthcare tax cuts. And specifically, there's a new 3.8 tax increase on investment. As of 2013, the top income tax rate will rise from its current level of 35% all the way to 44.8%. The tax on dividends could triple from its current level of 15% to 45.4%. And the tax on capital gains will rise from 15% to 23.8%. Um, but you're calling for robust economic growth in that very year. Do you think that the tax increases that you're planning on in 2013 on mostly successful small businesses in the investment community in America, on job creators, um, is you think it's not going to impact the economy? You think that's the year where the economy takes off? Because if it doesn't, then you never reach primary balance as you're claiming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, th there was in December an agreement that we should extend certain tax provisions for two years, and there are th some provisions that uh, do take effect or go out of effect because of that. Um, I think if you look at our economic assumptions, uh, the economic assumptions in the short term are actually a little bit more pessimistic than some of the outside uh, observers. In the long term, they're a little bit more optimistic, and it's driven by one key difference, which is an important conceptual difference. The question is, will we recover from this recession the way we've recovered from past recessions? If you look historically, uh, financially led recessions have had slightly longer periods of recovery, but in the end we get back to where the gr economy would have been. Uh, we assume that that's the case. Uh, we are within the range of recoveries uh, from past financially led recessions, and we think that they are very prudent, reasonable assumptions. Um, undoubtedly, I, I, I apologize, I'm a lawyer, not an economist, so I could get into a level of detail here which is probably beyond my own training. 
But economists can disagree about what year it would happen, and they can disagree about uh, you know, whether or not we'll get back to what was the potential uh, GDP before. We think it's the right thing to do to get our economy back there. And that's one of the reasons we've put forward a budget that invests in the things that it takes to keep growing the economy. And we think education, innovation, and infrastructure are key to it. Here's what doesn't add up to me. You're saying in 2013, you're going to have economic growth 1.3% uh, higher than what CBO believes, 1.4% uh, percentage points higher than what the blue chip believes, and you're claiming this explosion of growth at a year where you're raising taxes across the board on entrepreneurs, small businesses, investors, investments. Um, history doesn't square with your, your comments. And if, and if we're right and you're wrong about this, then you'll never reach primary balance. Then you, you, the, the $1.7 trillion you're claiming in extra revenue because of the higher economic growth you're claiming above and beyond what CBO claims doesn't materialize then, and we are in a world of trouble. And, and I'll just finish with this. What, what's so frustrating about this is you know the drivers of our debt are the entitlement programs, and yet you're do doing nothing to address that. I mean, we elect president. Look, we're in different parties. That's fine. But when people elect a president, they expect the president to lead, to take on the country's biggest challenges before they become actually crises. <laughs> and we all know that this debt is becoming a crisis. And you're not even touching these programs. You're assuming the economy is going to take off in a year in which you're raising taxes everywhere, all over the economy. And if your math doesn't add up, then we're all in a world of hurt, and this will cost us jobs. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you look at the tax provisions, uh, the vast majority uh, are of the revenues you're talking about are associated with the tax rate at the top end, the, you know, the, the tax rates for people who earn $250,000 a year or more. I would just note that uh, during the last administration I served and during the Clinton administration, at those tax rates, we had the longest period of uninterrupted growth in American history. So they're not tax rates that have historically been challenging to growth. If you look inside our budget where there are new proposals, we have a lot of tax cut proposals that are t designed to promote the kinds of uh, investment that we need in this country. Uh, and we net have $360 billion of new revenue. So it doesn't amount to a large amount in 2013. Jack, I, I, I don't know where you come I'm not, I'm not sure where you're from, but where I come from, most of our jobs come from successful small businesses. In Wisconsin, you drive to any city, and there's going to be an industrial park with a sub S, a LLC, with 100, maybe 200, 300 employees. They file taxes as individuals. Most of the top tax rate are actually small businesses. And when we're top taxing our, tax, our small businesses at rates above 50% in most states, like Wisconsin, 44.8% in this country, where most of our competitors are taxing their businesses at rates lower than we are, how do we expect to win global competition? How do we expect to create jobs when we're taxing the engine of economic growth and job creation, small businesses, at rates in excess of 50% in most states? I, I think if we look at who are the taxpayers in that class at 250000 or above and where the revenue goes, uh, I'm from New York. A lot of it goes to finance and a lot of it goes to law. And I think that it's not uh, the case that the top rate is something that's principally a small business issue. I think we have a lot of tax proposals that would make taxes easier for small businesses. The right way to target small business is to make sure that we do things that are targeted to investment and not to the kinds of income that drives people into that top bracket in the most cases. All right, well, Mr. Van Helen. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Liu, as, as I indicated in my opening statement, I, I think it's an important achievement that in this budget uh, you reach primary balance uh, by the year 2017 and begin to stabilize the problem. Uh, but I also indicated that I think we all need to work together, especially uh, to take actions now to deal with what are going to be projected deficits in the next uh, 20 uh, years, and I think that conversation should begin now. Uh, but I, I do want to point out in the spirit of this is not easy to do when you've dug yourself as a country in a deep hole, digging itself out, that there are other alternatives out there. And I, I want to, and the chairman of the committee uh, has, has put forward an alternative in the roadmap in good faith and a sincere effort to 
uh, reduce the deficit. So it's in that spirit that I, I just want to point out that when the Congressional Budget Office last January uh, scored that budget uh, proposal, that deficit proposal, that they indicated that uh, in the year 2020, uh, the deficit would be negative three point, uh, the deficit would be 3.7 percent of GDP, uh, and that the budget would not be in primary balance under, th under that plan as of that date, uh, and that in fact, if you go out another 20 years till 2040, uh, the deficit of percent of GDP is four and a half percent, and the budget is just then getting into primary balance. A and I point that out, Mr. Chairman, not, not to be, what, to, to, show, to show you how, how hard it is. And so as we, as we, as, as some criticize the President's effort, just recognize that other sincere efforts that were made actually brought the deficit into primary balance later uh, than the President's budget. And there are going to be conversations about different assumptions. But my point is these deficit numbers were, were the result of a good faith effort. And uh, I think the President's made a good faith effort. And we do all need to get together. Now, I want to focus um, to, to discuss the longer-term outlook. Uh, I, I want to discuss what's happening today on the floor as it impacts, um, a, as, it, as it draws contrast with the approach that the uh, Obama administration has taken with respect to the, the deficit. As, as you indicated, you're, you're talking about significant cuts uh, in domestic discretionary spending. Um, as you know from listening to many of my colleagues, uh, these are going to have a, a real impact and a painful impact in many people's lives, but you have decided that in order to get deficits under control, uh, we're going to have to make those tough decisions, and, and we agree. Um, at the same time, uh, today on the floor, uh, there are proposals to cut immediately and deeply, and I, I just want to read to you a statement from the President's bipartisan, bipartisan deficit commission. Uh, that we're hearing lots of positive things about uh, from our colleagues about their recommendations and approach. And here, here's what they said, and I quote, in order to avoid shocking the fragile economy, the commission recommends waiting until 2012 to begin enacting programmatic spending cuts. Another bipartisan commission, the Rivlin Dominici Commission, rendered the same advice. Uh, Mark Zandi and other economists have indicated that Deep, immediate cuts in contrast to responsible and planned cuts over a period of time, that deep, immediate cuts could harm the fragile economy and hurt job growth. If you could please comment on the proposals today for very deep and very immediate cuts and the impact they would have on the economy and job growth, in your opinion. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen, I, I think we have a, a, a tough balance that we have to strike. Um, uh, we agree that it would be a mistake to do drastic uh, deficit reduction um, in this year that we're in, um, beginning of next year. We had bipartisan agreement in December on the tax bill, largely because of the concern that we needed to keep the economy moving, that we couldn't afford the drag that a tax increase in January would have had. At the same time, we need to focus on reducing spending. We need to focus on making decisions that will turn the corner on the deficit. And we can't really wait uh, years to do that. I think our budget has a frame that we think is the right frame for making the tough trade-offs. And, and I, we're going to have to work as we go through the remainder of the, the legislation for fiscal year 11 and then as we work together on next year to come up with the right balance. I think it's important that we have the right balance. Um, you don't need to make uh, the kinds of cuts that you're describing uh, in order to get on the right path, but you do need to tighten the belt, which is what our budget is saying. And uh, we're, we're watching carefully as the House continues work. We'll be working with the House and the Senate and then ultimately together to, to do the responsible thing and fund the government. Um, but I think it's a question of, of not, um, not f uh, mixing uh, uh, too many things together. Uh, the the, the, the long-term challenge is what we've got to keep our eye on. And when I say long-term, in this window of, of the next 10 years, we've got to look to the middle of the decade. And are we on a path towards getting down to a deficit where we stop adding to the debt? And that's what we've tried to do in the budget. 
as some of our um, uh, Republican colleagues have indicated that if they don't get their way uh, in terms of these uh, very deep and immediate cuts that could harm the economy, but if they don't get their way on those cuts, uh, that they would shut down uh, the government. Now, we've seen this movie before. Uh, I know you have. If you could just uh, make clear what some of the impacts of that would be on things like the Social Security Administration and other essential functions of government. Well, I, uh, I, I take the congressional leadership uh, at their word that we all want to avoid a situation like that. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not the right way to run the government, um, and I, th I think we have a broad agreement that uh, we have to keep essential services going. Yeah, uh, when the government shut down in the mid-1990s, um, it was very uh, unpleasant. Uh, it was unpleasant when people needed to apply for passports because a relative was ill or passed away overseas and they couldn't get a passport. Uh, and people started to appreciate things that they just took for granted, but when the government shut down, they stopped. Um, I hope we don't get to the point where uh, we're having to go through that again. And I think if we all work together in a bipartisan way to look for the things we can agree on and take some of the things that we can't agree on and put them off to the side, we can accomplish a great deal. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I'll just simply say for the record, it is not our desire to see the government shut down, but equally we don't want to you know, rubber stamp these elevated spending levels. We want to see a beginning of a down payment on spending reductions. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just reiterate what you just said. It's nobody's desire to shut down the government. What we want to do is reduce spending, and that's what we're, uh, that's what we're trying to do with the budget that we're bringing to the floor. Uh, everybody talks about dr draconian cuts. You got to remember, this is on top of uh, enormous increases that have occurred over the last couple of years. So it's not as draconian as a lot of people would like. But I appreciate your your uh, testimony. I appreciate your hard work on uh, this budget. I know it's hard to put together a budget, uh, even if it is uh, one that uh, <coughs> most people. I want to say this respectfully, but most people don't take seriously. Most people don't think this is ever going to be enacted. Uh, all the right words are used. I think the ranking member said this is a tough love budget. If this was the tough love that my father had showed me when I was young, I'd still be a juvenile delinquent. Uh, uh, some people think I still am. I understand that. <laughs> I've, heard that I've, <laughs> I've heard that we have to make tough choices are going to be necessary. We have to live within our means. Let me ask you, this budget theoretically goes to balance in what, 16 years? Well, it, it does. It, it's going to take a long time to go to balance. We first have to stabilize the Is debt. Is there ever a balance projection out there? Um, you know, it, 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 we to get to balance will require uh, a, a set of decisions that um, are beyond what anyone's discussing right now. Every all the conversations. Why is no one discussing that? Well, I'll tell you. The last time I testified before this committee, I presented a balanced budget with a surplus. I understand what it takes to get to a balanced budget. We've gone through ten years of a combination of things that have driven the deficit up. We've had an economic crisis, but we also had decisions to not pay for what we were doing. We now are going to have to deal with the results of that, and it's not going to be a quick process. Um, I know that I left things in pretty good shape 10 years ago. I look forward to leaving things in better shape when I'm done this time. I don't deny that you did. We have a tendency in this committee to sit and look back at certain indicators that uh, prove our point of view. All of those don't really matter. What matters is where we are today and where we're going to be in the future. And what the American people are saying is, get your fiscal house in order. I don't see this getting our fiscal house in order. I've noticed that everybody says, well, this, we're going to have $400 billion in cuts and savings in this budget. Like, that's some big deal. $400 billion. Yeah, it's a lot of money. That's over 10 years, right? Yes. That's uh, like $40 billion a year. The budget this year's proposal is $3.73 trillion. Yes. $40 billion in savings. This that's is like that's less than 1% or around 1% in savings. This is not tough love. This is, this is continuing the path we're currently on with no future balanced budget ever in this proposal, and the American people are rejecting it, frankly. Uh, Congressman, uh, let me just say a couple of things. First, um, you know, we have put what we believe to be a very serious uh, proposal. It's comprehensive forward. We don't think we have a monopoly on all knowledge or wisdom. We look forward to seeing the ideas that are put forward. And when you put forward a budget that reduces the deficit, I'm sure there'll be things in it that we can agree on. There'll be things that we can't agree on. And that's what this, this is the first step in the process. 
I know that it's easy for uh, pundits on the outside to dismiss uh, you know, the starting point, but the president's budget is the starting point. And it is a frame, it is a comprehensive frame. And I think that it does achieve something very important, which it stabilizes a deficit at 3% of GDP by the middle of the decade. And while I totally agree that we need to be on a path that goes beyond that, and I wish we were on a path where we could together talk about balance, until we stop adding to the national debt, we can't talk about getting to balance. And this budget would get you there. We won't agree on all the details. And I know that some of the actions that have been taken in this House uh, do cut spending. I haven't seen the actions yet that reduce the deficit, and I look forward to that. I know that it's the beginning of the process, and, and we will work together when we see your proposals. Well, we all understand that you are not going to get to balance by simply cutting spending. But spending is a portion of how you get there. You also have to look at the entitlement programs with this budget totally left out in terms of reforming the entitlement programs. And everyone, I think the American people understand that we have to address entitlement reform. And leadership has to come from the White House to do that, quite frankly. Uh, Congressman, uh, we agree that we need to reduce spending. I think if you look in this budget, uh, this is possibly the toughest budget uh, certainly a Democratic president has ever put forward, cutting things that are very, very important priorities, things that many of us have worked for decades because we believe in to grow. We've said we've got to tighten our belt, we've got to do what every American family does and make the tough choices. So I think there are real tough choices in this budget. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that we haven't dealt with entitlements. We certainly haven't dealt completely with entitlements. But $62 billion of savings to pay for Medicare in the next two years is something. It's real. It's a first step. It's a down payment. I think that if we're going to work together on entitlements, we also have to acknowledge that Social Security is not driving the deficit between now and 2021. You know, I worked on social security reform for, well, 1983, I was working on the reform bill. So I, I deeply, deeply believe that we have an obligation to current workers, to future retirees, to current retirees, to have a system that's sound and reliable for decades and decades to come. But it's not contributing to the short-term deficit. We should do it because it's the right thing to do. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. For Thank you. Uh, Nish Schwartz. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, and thank you. Uh, good, to, good to have you here, and thank you for your uh, good work on uh, this first budget uh, that you're uh, presenting. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate and there's more in your written remarks than what you said here, but your reference, you did reference how we got here. And I don't want to dwell on this, but I appreciate the fact that you laid out very, very clearly that uh, the national debt and the economic crisis that the president inherited. Uh, and the work that the President and the Democratic Congress did in the last two years uh, to bring us out of what was obviously a really deep, really broad, uh, and in many cases devastating recession for this country. Uh, it is, but being clear that we, in, the President inherited a $10 trillion debt, this didn't all happen in the last two years, uh, and, uh, and of course the recession actually meant that there are fewer people paying, paying taxes too, so it's reduced our revenues. Uh, the, the President's budget uh, really does, I believe, make very clear that we can't accept the status quo. That where we've gotten to is a better place. Uh, we're beginning to see a growth in the economy, beginning to see uh, some growth in, in jobs, which is good, um, and we just can't uh, sit on our hands. Nor do I think uh, that we, and I think you've rejected this, uh, are rejecting uh, the notion that we can get to a place where we can balance the budget and grow the economy simply by spending cuts. And my Republican colleague did acknowledge that, and I appreciate that, because that is their pre proposal right now. The only thing we can do is spending cuts uh, and actually uh, tax cuts, but uh, that alone is not going to get us there. Uh, and that is what is being presented by the Republican majority. But I, um, and I also will agree with my, uh, well, the that was made by the Republican side that uh, budgets are about priorities and values. And I think this is uh, something that the President has made it very clear, that we cannot uh, only focus on deficit reduction, we need to reduce the deficit, but if we are going to grow the economy, put people back to work, that we have to invest in the future. Uh, and that's what I wanted to uh, ask you about. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge, of course, that the budget does reduce the deficit by $1.1 trillion, and that's real money for most of us. Uh, and it's not easy to get there. Uh, and it brings fiscal stability uh, to the nation uh, in uh, 2017. Primary balance 
Again, nothing, none of this is easy. Uh, but the budget also does make strategic investments in the future. And for many of us in our districts across the country, if we're going to see growth in this economy, the focus on energy, on innovation, uh, on education, uh, on infrastructure is important. And every business I talk to uh, says to me, we, we need, uh, we look at, when we locate, do we have incentives for innovation? Do we have the kind of infrastructure that allows us to move our products and, and our workforce? Is there an educated workforce? Uh, they ask about taxes too, but they want to know, and it starts with, where's the infrastructure? Right. Where are the advantages for innovation? Uh, and so um, I think we need to talk about that, because otherwise we're really just looking at a slash and burn willy-nilly, let's just cut spending uh, right now. And again, the Budget Deficit Commission said, not a good idea in a fragile economy. So I would like you to elaborate a bit on the tax credits uh, that are available to businesses to incentivize and research and development key to our growth, um, because it is the private sector in this country that does create the new discoveries, the new technologies, the new products, uh, but they often look to us for that helping hand. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that if you were to ask most businesses that are in the high technology area, what's the single thing we could do that would give them stability looking forward? It would be to make permanent the R&D tax credit. The uncertainty from year to year um, is a very difficult way to do business. And while in Washington there's a kind of conventional wisdom that we know it'll be extended because it has to be extended, if you're a business person trying to make a decision, trying to go get financing, trying to get investors, Having that ambiguity out there can be life or death as far as your business is concerned. So I think putting in our budget a Absolutely. permanent extension in the context of a fiscal policy that pays for it is very important. I think it's also important to remember that there's a, a, a role for uh, government-funded programs and tax support in R&D. Basic research in this country has really been very much enhanced by what we do at the National Institute of Health, what we do in the National Science Foundation, what we do in the Department of Energy. And w what's made us the leaders in innovation is that the technology that's discovered in places where, frankly, the risk should be shared by all of us, um, it's then handed off to a private sector that has the capacity to implement it more effectively than any other in the world. And we've tried to balance that. So I, don't, I hate to cut you off, but you know, I just want to make sure every member gets a chance. It needs to go no. over to five minutes. But appreciate your comments. We'll so keep working together okay. on that. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Director Liu. Thank you. Um, in your budget, uh, you've proposed to increase federal civilian employment outside of the Department of Defense by 22,400 people in the coming fiscal year, 2012. Seriously, uh, do you want to increase the number of federal employees now? Well, we have an awful lot of agencies that are going down. The increases are very much concentrated in areas where there are new missions, um, and they're missions that I think are shared concerns. If we put in place uh, new screening procedures at our airports and we put in the machinery so that we can make sure that no one gets on an airplane with an explosive. We also need to have the inspectors there who run the machines, who know what's in them. I think if you go through the increases, they're very heavily in areas where there's new missions that we're undertaking. And I'm happy to get back to you after and go through some of them. Okay, so you, you do propose to increase by 22,000? No, in, in, in general, if you look through the budget, there's a lot of agencies that go down. So uh, we don't have a general, well, a, a general approach. 22,400 is the net increase outside of defense. So um, another question. Your, your predecessor, Dr. Orzag, uh, before this committee on several occasions, said that the current fiscal trajectory of the country was unsustainable. Uh, do you share that view? You know, I think this budget stands for the principle that we have to get our fiscal house in order, that uh, we have to take seriously um, stopping uh, the practice of treating deficits like they don't matter. And we've put a plan forward that would eliminate, that would get us to primary balance by the middle of the decade. Okay, uh, let me, uh, that was the challenge that he was describing ahead of us at the time. Absent this budget, you agree that the current current trajectory is unsustainable? Yeah, I, I don't think that, I mean, if you look at what's driving the deficit down, part of it is getting the economy moving again. We get about half. Okay, wait, wait, Director Lowe, I understand you're a lawyer, but it, 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 
Is it unsustainable? That word is used by a lot of people. And there, and I, I, was I was going to answer your question. Okay. I, I was just, uh, I, I need to break it into the pieces in order to answer your question. I mean, the, we need to keep the economy growing in order to not have an unsustainable deficit because the kind of financial crisis we've in, the, the recession, creates enormous problems in our fiscal policy. We've got policies in place to do that. But then we can't stay at deficits that are 5% of GDP, which is roughly where we'd be if we didn't make policy. We need to make policy to bring it down so we can get to primary balance. We've done that, and I do think that that is what we have to do to have a sustainable fiscal policy. So is this budget sustainable? Does it solve the problem? It, 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 those are two different issues. I think that it, sustainable is a step along the way. I think the problem is bigger than that. I think that, you know, I, I preferred sitting in this seat when I could project surpluses in healthy economic times. Um, we're a long way from being able to do that on either side of the aisle. Uh, it, it, I mean, we're going to need to work together to get to the point where we stop adding to the problem, and then we're going to need to work together to solve the rest of it. Er earlier, I, I believe you did use the word sustainable with this budget. Uh, so do you believe that, that if we did this budget and it was enacted for the next 10 years exactly as it is on this paper, uh, that we move along fine? Country, country. Uh, <laughs> doesn't have a, we don't have a debt problem, we don't have a problem. No, I think that this budget produces a deficit that is sustainable for a period of time so that we can then work together. It's a down payment and then, then we need then to work afterwards, together. Afterwards, the deficit goes up after the 10 years of this budget. It starts to creep up and as you get 20 years out, it starts to be a problem again. There's more work ahead of us. I, I, I totally uh, agree with the notion that we cannot just look at the next five or 10 years. So but I'm saying have we have to, to start by looking at the next five to ten years. So we do have to deal with the entitlement programs? Uh, the president said in the State of the Union and in this budget that we have to look to the short term and the long term. We need to work together why not, on that. Why not propose something now? Well, the, this budget proposes a great deal to get us to primary balance. It gets us to a place that's sustainable. And it extends the offer, as the president did in the State of the Union, to work together. We've tried to leave options on the table. We've tried to create an environment where we'll be able to work on things that have historically been challenging. And I think that you know, we, need to, we need to do both. I think I'm out of time. I'm not yeah, sure. The clock did funny issues things. The clock. We'll get the clock fixed. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mr. Doggett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your service. And I want to draw attention to the last time you came before this committee, because it was an unusual time in which uh, you did not just talk about a balanced budget, but as you made reference in an earlier comment, you working with President Clinton and this Congress produced a balanced budget, something that no Republican president before or after has done in decades. Uh, and uh, the unfortunate thing is that having produced that balanced budget, our Republican colleagues in the Bush-Cheney administration when they took over, instead of building on that success, squandered that success. They never met a tax break they didn't like. They believed in the alchemy that every expert who came here, Republican and Democrat alike, told them that those tax breaks wouldn't pay for themselves, but they abandoned pay-as-you-go government. They, in addition to all the tax breaks that they advanced, they advanced one increase in spending after another, increasing government spending at an incredible rate, but not wanting to pay for any of it. And so after eight years, of running our debt up and our economy down, they're complaining today that you haven't solved all the problems that they created in eight years fast enough. And I think that's basically the circumstance in which we find ourselves. With reference specifically to this question you were just asked about the 22,000 increase in government employees, isn't a large part of that related to the honesty that this administration brings uh, to federal employment that you can contract out and create the appearance that you're reducing the size of government, but many of these contracting out experience, experiments of the last eight years just ended up costing taxpayers more and producing less. That is part of it, and the other kinds of examples that I used explain uh, the other part of it. We also have a very, very large workforce, and this is a very small percentage of the total. And then I want to ask you about one type of entitlement spending uh, that I'm encouraged to see, and I want to explore with you a, a minute about it, uh, that the administration, uh, again, seems to be focusing on for the first time something prior administrations have not done, and that's the whole area of uh, uh, tax expenditures, because they really do amount to entitlement since they're entirely mm -hmm. out of the budget process. 
you have uh, for the first time uh, since 1993 of, of any president uh, revised that section of your budget and it would appear that tax expenditures which now rival uh, direct discretionary expenditures uh, will receive some type of uh, thorough evaluation uh, by the administration and I just ask you first to comment generally about what you see going forward and whether uh, perhaps we will eventually have a tax expenditure budget uh, to allow a more thorough comparison the tax expenditures and the direct expenditures. Uh, Congressman Doggett, the, the issue of tax expenditures is a very important one. If you look at the work the Fiscal Commission did, one of the places where I think they made a real contribution was in having a conversation about spending on both the revenue and the, the direct spending side. If you look at the President's budget, um, the proposal that I described as the way we pay for the alternative minimum tax extension is a prime example of uh, how we begin to get at spending on the tax side. It says that you know, we have a host of provisions in the tax code that are of more value as you get into a higher and higher tax bracket, and that we should limit it so that someone who's a family at 250000 and above gets the same value as people at 250000 and below. It doesn't take the deduction away. It starts to trim the value of it. We think that that's a measured way to start getting at this issue of spending in the tax code. And we think it's something that ought to be the basis for being able to begin a serious conversation. And do you envision during the coming year a thorough and careful evaluation of these tax expenditures and implementing what you say in your budget appendix? Well, well the, the, the President has proposed in the State of the Union and in the budget that we begin to work together on corporate tax reform. That uh, you know, we have a, a general bipartisan consensus. Just on that point in specific, I'm very pleased that he and his State of the Union and Secretary Geithner have, have indicated that that must be revenue neutral. Uh, I think it actually ought to be revenue increasing to help deal with this problem, but that's a non-negotiable position yeah. of the administration. We're not going to see uh, us borrow from the Chinese in order to give tax cuts yeah. to corporations always. And he, so the principle that the President set forth was that we should broaden the base, lower the rates so we could be more competitive and it's pr really principally a way to drive our international competitiveness. Uh, th that's going to be challenging because once we've all agreed on that broad principle, broadening the base means that you take away special interest tax Thank provisions. Mr. Mr. Calvert. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to make a point. Uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, took over the Congress in 2007, and that's when you see significant spending increases, and as I understand it, Congress does have something to do with spending around here, and uh, that's certainly a big part of it. Um, I want to thank uh, our guests for coming out today. I understand the traffic was bad. I saw it out there. It was pretty difficult. Um, the uh, couple of things you, you pointed out to drive uh, uh, people to investment. Uh, I'm a small businessman, was a small businessman, and uh, uh, how do you drive people to investment if you have significant increases uh, down the road in capital gains rates? I think that the, the, the responsibility that we have first and foremost is to keep a, a healthy growing economy uh, where there's demand and uh, where there's business activity out there. So I think that going to our big frame, the most important thing we can do to promote investment is to, to be responsible in the way we conduct our fiscal policy. You know, within that, we have made the kinds of choices that we think are th where the government can really be helpful in terms of driving the economy of the future. You know, when you talk to business leaders, I, in my job, fairly frequently talk to business leaders, I hear over and over again, where they have problems right now is hiring people with the right skills, engineering skills, technical skills. By producing the workforce that our businesses need, we're helping to promote business well, in this country. Well, you're claiming my time. Uh, you know, I, I find it difficult to believe that uh, the folks that I did business with finding capital gains rate going up significantly is going to make it easier for them to do business. But I have another question I want to ask. I'm also, my other job, I'm on the Defense Appropriation Committee, and uh, I wanted to uh, understand this new account you have to cover uh, devel uh, the uh, diplomatic and development costs of the U.S. involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as you know, in, in past years that was handled 
uh, in the uh, regular uh, base budget. And I want to understand what standards were used to determine what costs are appropriate for inclusion in this account. Uh, and can you send us a written sure. uh, guidance uh, for, uh, for the account for the record? I'm happy to get back for the record, but I can give you a brief answer if you'd like. Um, very, very brief. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the funding for military operations overseas are funded through what are called overseas contingency operations funding. It has not historically been an issue for the civilian side, but with things like the withdrawal of the troops in Iraq and the buildup of a civilian mission that's quite labor-intensive, security-intensive, it, it creates the same challenges that the military does. The simple rule that was used in putting it together was to the extent that we have activities that wouldn't carry on once we normalize our diplomatic footprint, those should be handled in the base. To the extent that we have activities that are more like that military surge, they should be in the overseas well, if account. You could get that to us Happy to. Writing, I would like to have that. The, also, the budget request 117 plus billion for DOD's account uh, or conduct of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's obviously dependent on U.S. troops level uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as you'll understand, under the SOFA agreement, the Status Force Agreement, we're bringing down the reduction or reducing uh, the force in Iraq into this calendar year. And, and Afghanistan has announced policy to a troop withdrawal on July 11. Though the size of that withdrawal uh, is, is still yet to be determined. Uh, what, on your assumption, what troop level are you assuming for Afghanistan and Iraq in this funding request? Well, in Iraq, we have a clearly stated policy uh, to withdraw our troops on a schedule, and the funding levels reflect that policy. In Afghanistan, what we, our policy is that we will begin to withdraw troops. Uh, we have not used the budget as the place to project specific numbers. That, that will have to be worked through by the national security team. Okay, yet to be determined. And last uh, question. Do you expect an additional war supplemental uh, to be uh, uh, asked for here in the short term? We, we have requested funds uh, that we know to be needed for the coming fiscal year. Um, we've not yet seen what the appropriations are for fiscal year 11. Um, we obviously don't know what the appropri pr appropriations will be for fiscal 12. So I can't give you a guarantee not knowing what will be appropriated. But I know we have estimated to the best of our ability what the cost will be. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lu, thank you for being here today. Now, we have three challenges facing us, and they need to be all addressed simultaneously. Um, we need to reduce the deficit. At the same time, we need to uh, grow the economy and create jobs that will keep America competitive. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the best way to reduce the deficit is to get America back to work. But we have tough choices to make. The big difference between making sound investments and smart cuts, as President Obama has proposed, or the path that uh, our Tea Party uh, Republican colleagues are taking on the uh, FY11 budget with ideology, mean-spirited, or just plain dumb cuts. Now, Mr. Liu, over the next years, Congress has provided, over the past years, Congress has provided tax breaks, tax cuts, tax loopholes, and special tax perks estimated to reduce revenues by more than $1 trillion. In December's legislation to extend the Bush tax cuts, some of the beneficiaries of these tax break earmarks were NASCAR racetrack owners, Caribbean rum manufacturers, at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars in foregone revenue. And the last point I'd like to make before I ask you uh, three questions is um, the discretionary defense spending over the next five years will approach $3 trillion, not including the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yet this budget pr uh, proposes only a 78 billion dollar reduction in defense spending, which is nothing more than a rounding error. Now, I know Congress is part of the problem. Despite the Pentagon's objections, I'm aware that the Republicans have included an alternative engine for the F-35 Joint Striker fi uh, Fighter and the F-11 CR at the cost of $45 million. Now, this is a total waste of taxpayer dollars and an example of congressional pork, and it should be eliminated. So, Mr. Liu, um, my questions are, um, you know, the defense discretionary spending is dwarfing all other domestic investments, keeping our community safe and strong and prospering. <coughs> Where can greater defense spending reductions take place over the next decade? Could you also uh, elaborate on the administration's plan to close tax loopholes and end special tax perks 
and cut off the special tax interest giveaways that are adding hundreds of billions of dollars to the deficit. And then if you have time, could you explain more on some of the President's ideas on how to grow this economy and create jobs? Um, thank you, Congressman McCollum. Um, let me start on, on DOD. You know, we, we um, I think, share on a bipartisan basis the belief that we have a core responsibility to provide for our national defense. Over the last 10 years, um, the spending on defense has been considerably above inflation, and it wasn't subject to the same kind of rigor that other things were. And we were also going through extraordinary times. This is not a judgment being made about the past, but as we look to the future, this budget says that we have to start pulling back, but not pulling back in a way that sacrifices our national security. The policy in this budget says that the Department of Defense will tamp down its increases so that it will have no real growth in the five-year window. That's $78 billion of savings compared to their five-year plan for the last year's budget. We think that is a very important step. It's an important step which requires tough choices. It means you can't afford the second engine that you don't need for the Joint Strike Fighter. It means you can't afford the Marine Expeditionary Vehicle. There are tough decisions that have to be made. And I think we have a Secretary of Defense and a leadership in our military that's prepared to make the tough choices, and we look forward to working with Congress. But they're hard. It means that there are things that are made now uh, that won't be made in the future. And that's what it's going to take to start getting our defense budget under control. On the question of closing loopholes, um, the President's budget includes a number of specific proposals. I mentioned the oil, gas, and coal provisions in my opening remarks, but we also have provisions that would take away the tax benefits that come to companies that export jobs. And we think that it's important to have our policies and our tax code be designed to reflect what we need to do in our economy. So w in our economy for the future, we need to develop the new renewable energy te te technology industry. That's going to create jobs in the future. I'm kind of getting to your third question by answering the second within the five minutes. Uh, the, 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 we're we're going to build the new economy in, in renewables and in clean energy. Um, and that's where we need to put our investment. So if you look at the withdrawal of a special provision for oil, gas, and coal, and the investment in new technologies, it kind of tells a story about how we think you invest uh, in the future. Mr. Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, years ago, uh, I was taught what was called the Harvard case study approach to solving problems, and it was taught in business schools, and the idea was that you're given this complicated situation, and you could see all sorts of things that would be a good thing to do, and you've got this, this, and this, and you have all these good ideas, but part of the discipline was pick the number one thing. What is the, the very first and essential element that you've got to deal with? And that was uh, frequently... Uh, the, the situation then that would determine whether a company was going to succeed or fail is I take a look at uh, many of the things we've discussed even here this morning and that you're dealing with on the budget. We're dealing with, uh, to some degree, some peripheral things, but it seems like the, uh, there has been pretty good emphasis that the elephant in the room is the uh, tremendous growth of entitlements. Uh, I just uh, heard references to the fact that maybe the defense budget is really the bugaboo here. But if you take a look at defense as a percent of GDP, you go back to maybe 67 or so, you're looking at close to 9% of GDP being spent on defense. It's now dropped to four something. And one of the few people on this committee sitting on armed services, we talk about, well, we're going to cut this expeditionary fighting vehicle for the Marines. The only problem is if you really believe in Marines, you've got to get them from the ocean to the shore. So I'm not so sure that. You, you've already cut the uh, percent of GDP for defense, um, not, not quite in half. And in the meantime, entitlements have gone from about 2.5% if you go beyond Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security to the other entitlements, you're well up at whatever it is, 12%. And you put entitlement and debt service together and all of a sudden, voila, that's what our revenue is. So it seems to me that the elephant in the room is the entitlements. And... Uh, courageous leadership is going to acknowledge that fact and say, okay, now let's have the conversation and talk about what we're going to do with those because uh, all of us know we're talking about some heavy cuts in discretionary, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, so I guess it's disappointing not to say, hey, let's, let's at least make this the main subject the main subject. 
Uh, the second thing that I don't quite understand is the phrase um, and, and uh, the uh, idea that we're going to somehow shock the fragile recovery by cutting discretionary income. I guess that's assuming that that discretionary income somehow by spending all that money, it helps the economy. I'd, if you could enlighten me in that line of reasoning because I don't understand that. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I have a soft spot for those uh, business school case studies. I paid my way through college by working on producing those case studies, so they've uh, played an important fault. part in my life. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, I think the core challenge we have, um, you know, the first thing I would do if looking in a, in a, at a university class at how do you solve the problem is saying, where do we need to be on the bottom line? And the bottom line is we need to have a 3% of GDP you know, deficit in order to say we're not adding to the debt. And then I would ask, what are you doing to get there? And we've put a forward a plan that gets there. And then I would say you separate the question of what do you need to do for the long term. And that's exactly what we've done in this budget. So I think we're dealing with the short term and the medium term. We're saying in a very direct way that we need to work together on the long term. And we're trying to leave as much open for discussion so that there's an environment where we can actually reach agreement. The easiest thing to do is to kind of polarize the environment. We, we're, we're deliberately leaving room for that conversation. You know, you talk about well, the Let me, let me uh, just jump in. I guess in order to come up with the numbers that you've come up with, some of the assumptions strike me as being a little odd. For instance, uh, some of my Democrat colleagues have talked about how uh, when uh, President Bush took office that he everything was rosy and perfect, but I recall there was quite a recession going in 2000, 2001. I do remember the numbers in uh, May of 2003. We did three unpopular tax cuts, capital gains, dividends, and death tax. They were unpopular because we were tarred and feathered as sticking up for the rich guy, but the trouble was it was those rich guys that owned the businesses that hired people. And if you destroy the businesses by overtaxing the owners of small business, then you don't have any jobs. And so I took a look at those numbers after capital gains, dividends, and death tax, and what we saw was that, first of all, the GDP jumped and it had the kind of growth that you want to make the budget numbers work. But we did it by cutting those taxes on the small business and the investors. Uh, we also saw that the employment turned right around. We got much more we went from unemploying a lot of people to jobs being created. And last of all, according to just what Laffer predicted, the government revenues actually jumped up when we cut the taxes because the fact the economy got back going. So I don't understand how you make it work with growth and, and still raising taxes. I would love to respond, but I suspect from the tapping I don't have time. time. Mr. <laughs> Pascrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I find it remarkable. And I say this with fondness, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Bless you, smart. <laughs> I, I, say, <laughs> I say this with fondness. You become an existential party. You have amnesia about the past <laughs> and how we got to this place. And you don't want us to invest in the future. We're stuck with the here and now. I don't think we are stuck. I think this is a pretty credible blueprint. And it's not going to be like this, I guess, when we finish. But I think it's a credible blueprint to begin with. We, uh, this is, uh, there's a si simple juxtaposition going on here. The President's budget, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Lou, the President's budget achieves substantial deficit reduction and achieves a sustainable debt of 3% of the GDP by 2015. Is that correct or incorrect? I would only correct it. It's the deficit that, that deficit. hit. Yeah. I'm sorry. A, a sustainable deficit. That's what I meant to say. Uh, second question is, isn't it true that in this president's budget, there is $5 billion in small business tax cuts for 2012. And if you add up the 10 years, there's $116 billion in real tax cuts for small businesses. Is that correct? Um, there, there are substantial incentives for small business. Um, they do add up to a number roughly like that. I don't have the n exact number in front of me. I assume you have the correct number. Okay. Here's my first question then, second question. 
some of my colleagues who I admire and respect, and that's nothing to smile about, I mean, but I don't have to agree with them, right? Some of my colleagues criticize the President's budget that it does not cut entitlement programs like Medicare. In fact, Mr. Chairman, I went outside for water and the President was providing us with his address at 11 o'clock about the budget. And that was his first question. Why didn't you show leadership? I think those were your words yesterday. Why did you show leadership uh, in uh, attack going after Medicare and Social Security? And we know Social Security has very little to do with the deficit. We would agree with that, correct? I personally believe we can balance the deficit without cutting Medicare for seniors. That's my own personal belief. You could do other things. However, is it not true, Mr. Lou, that federal health care reform adopted many recommendations from Congress's own independent advisory commission, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. <coughs> we established that, did we not? Okay. And that by having a Medicare Center for Innovation, Medicare now can test and use new payment models. We fought to have that in there for a very specific reason, uh, to not only improve patient care, but lower our national spending on health care. Would you just respond to that, please? Uh, Congressman, you know, I, I think that there are many, many things that we've done in the last couple of years that are very important in health care. We have real savings in the 10 years, bigger savings beyond that, and we've put in place mechanisms like the one you've described that give us the ability to get to best practices, which are the way we're going to reduce spending overall going forward. A lot of those things don't score easily because there's a question about when they'll have results. We believe they will have results, and we have to stay on the course of, of implementing it so that we make sure we get the benefit. And many of those were not even scored. By correct, them. correct. Why, why that doesn't mean they're not real. It just means yeah. that they're, it, it, you first have to demonstrate it. Why should we be paying for police to patrol the streets of Kabul and Baghdad? Why is that exempt when we say defense appropriation? Why well, is that I, exempt but not cops on the beat? in Patterson, New Jersey, or Camden, New Jersey, or anywhere. Why? Well, I guess I want to start by saying that we provide funding to make sure we can keep cops on the street in Camden, New Jersey, as well. So we, we don't believe that the choice is you either do one or the other. That, that one of the things we've tried to do is preserve funding for the, the cops program. I, I think the short answer to the question of why we should be supporting the training of police in Afghanistan is that in order for us to get to the point where we can withdraw American troops, Afghanistan's going to need to have the ability to protect itself so that we're not put at risk, and that's part of our plan. I was talking about the security uh, in our own uh, country. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Part of our problem here is we have witnesses in high demand. I want to make sure every member gets a chance, so I ask unanimous consent that we reduce our time to four minutes each uh, so that we can make sure we can accommodate everybody and still allow Mr. Liu his chance to go over to the Senate to testify. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Cole. Well, I was going to object because it was my time. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my friend Mr. Price and I think we either need to get taller or you guys in the front row need to get a lot shorter. It's very hard to see you there. Th this has actually changed since yeah. the last time yeah. I was here. I find myself leaning forward a lot more. <laughs> but since my time is short, um, I've got three areas I'd, I would like to ask you about. And uh, The first is just looking at your budget. Uh, you basically keep 80 percent of the Bush tax cuts for about 95 percent of the people that receive them. Does that suggest, one, that uh, you don't think those went to the rich particularly, uh, and two, that you see them as having been and continuing to be beneficial to the economy? You know, uh, the, we, we believe that the tax cuts for the middle class are a good thing. It it, that there were, was too high a tax rate uh, burden, uh, that, and, and we should continue to do what we can to minimize the tax burden on the middle class. One thing that I would just point out is that we don't take the benefit of those tax breaks away from anyone, even if they're above 250000 We just say there shouldn't be additional tax breaks. No, I, I understand yeah. that, and I, uh, you know, again, I applaud the President for embracing literally 80 percent of the Bush tax cuts, something that seems to be forgotten around here sometime. We can disagree about 20 percent, sure. but 80 percent we actually do agree on. Second uh, question, and this gets maybe to, to your philosophy, the administration's philosophy. Um, in your budget, uh, 
excuse me, your deficit reduction plan over several years, you have some tax increases, you have some spending restraints. Roughly, what's the balance that you strike between tax increases and spending cuts or restraints? Well, uh, I apologize that it's a little bit of a complicated answer just because baselines make how you measure complicated, and I want to be clear. Uh, we start with a baseline that assumes that the tax rate in the top bracket goes, stays where it will be when the provisions enacted last December expire. From that baseline, we have net uh, $360 billion of additional revenue. But I say net because we have $392 billion of tax cuts. So we have, um, you know, after you pay for the tax cuts, net $360 billion of new revenues. And how much in spending restraint? Um, we have uh, $751 billion in uh, mandatory and non-security um, uh, discretionary savings. And we do count debt service as spending because we have to pay for debt service. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we'd probably disagree uh, over whether letting those uh, tax cuts run out amounts to a tax increase or not, but let me put that aside. Let me get to the last point I wanted to ask you about, and this really does get down to actually some questions my friend uh, Mr. Aiken raised. Uh, look, we all know entitlement spending is going to be uh, a major area of focus. As an appropriator, I will be thrilled the day we finally move to uh, tax expenditures and entitlement expenditures, because that's where the problem is. Uh, but since you, you've expressed a lot of the, the, the President wants to do this, doesn't want to take options off the table, I'm like everybody else, I'm rather disappointed we haven't seen more at this point. But can you tell me when that discussion would begin? Is the President going to propose a format in which it would take place? Does he think he should lead with a proposal of his own or wait for Congress to put one on? I mean, I'm sort of mystified about how we get to the elephant in the room that Mr. Aiken was talking about. Well, the President has put quite a lot on the table in the budget that we presented yesterday, and it's the first step of the process. We have a lot of uh, work to do together, both in terms of finishing the work on uh, 2011, getting to work on 2012. You know, I, I have to tell you from my own personal experience, uh, having watched and been part of the, the deficit reduction efforts in the seven, late 70s, 80s, 90s, um, when we've had real success on a bipartisan basis, it's come from people working together behind the scenes and in an environment where there could be the kinds of open conversations where there's trust. And I think that if we concentrate on developing that kind of a conversation, will again produce the best results for the American people. I thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Casper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. I'd like to thank show you a chart here. The I understand you were the head of ONB in the last years of the Clinton administration where there were burgeoning debts and growing deficits. But at the end of the Clinton administration, is it true that you left when we had a uh, projected 10-year surplus of $5.6 trillion? Yeah, I would just correct. I, I was director of OMB three years in a row when we had surpluses. We didn't have deficits. We had surpluses. We were paying down the debt. So I that's what I that stand, chart says. I stand yeah. corrected. <laughs> and then uh, at the, when President Obama took office, we were facing an $8 trillion 10-year uh, deficit. Right. It must be entirely frustrating so. to you. Uh, it must have been frustrating during that that eight-year period to watch what happened to the surpluses uh, left at the end of the Clinton administration? I mean, I, I, I don't exaggerate when I say it breaks my heart. I mean, I, I think that the, you look at what drove the deficit up. Some of it was beyond our control in terms of the economy. Uh, and when there's a recession, there's a loss of revenue, and there's certain spending that you have. Some of it was because of wars, which you don't necessarily choose, but if you go to war, that's an extraordinary circumstance. Some of it was because we just suspended the basic common sense of paying for what we did. And we had tax cuts and spending increases that weren't paid for, and that is what's created the long-term problem we're dealing with now. These other things correct themselves. The economy is recovering, and we're going to see revenues and spending get back to their more normal levels. The wars will come to an end. We're pulling our troops home from Iraq. The other creates a problem that we have to deal with. And that's why I'm grateful that you've, you've taken on this new challenge. Uh, and this budget, I think, reflects, and we all agree, government has got to live within its means. 
but we must remain mindful that we are coming out of the most severe recession in our lifetimes, and we've got to build on the economic uh, foundation for the future, and that's why I'm, I'm particularly focused on, on job creation and job and our workforce. Uh, my district is home to one of the largest universities in the country and a lot of community colleges and private universities. And I am 100% uh, behind you on, on what this budget does to maintain the maximum Pell Grant for students. For our students, it remains at $5,550 for students. You all know that the Pell Grant helped over 9 million students across America afford uh, college. Now, over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of confusion in the press, however, over what's happening with the Pell Grant. It appears that President Obama maintains the maximum Pell Grant at $5,550 for 2012 for students, and you pay for it uh, by cutting the relatively new year-round Pell Grant that allowed some students to qualify for two Pell Grants. I wasn't aware that they could, they could do that. Uh, are you also aware that in contrast to what, what the President's budget is trying to do, right now on the floor of the House, the Republican continuing resolution <coughs> has proposed cuts in the Pell Grant by $845 per student for 2011. Uh, I think that's moving in the wrong direction when we want to ensure that we have the most competitive workforce uh, across the globe. So could you explain uh, your budget and why you viewed this as a priority and your view of the Republican efforts to diminish support for students and how it will hurt our national goal of supporting an educated workforce that can outcompete others. And I ask you to explain that in six <laughs> seconds, otherwise get the rest in writing, please. We think Pell Grants are an enormously important program. We've taken the tough <laughs> steps in this Eddie? budget to pay for it. And when you look at where some of the increases in spending since 2008 now are, Pell Grants is one of the biggest, and we think it's one of the best investments we Thank can you. make in our future. Look, I, I, just all members, look, if you ask your question at the end of your time allotted, you're taking away from our fellow colleagues. So that's why I'm being judicious with the, with, with the gavel here so everybody gets a chance. Uh, Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, w uh, Director Luth, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, uh, some of our friends on the other side of the aisle, one of them said uh, there's the, on, on our side, there's a, quote, amnesia about the past, unquote. So I want to visit a little bit of, of the amnesia that, that uh, goes around to the other side. Um, you, you said that the last time you were before this, co this committee, it was a good time because you had produced a balanced budget. Um, what party was in control of Congress at, in the House of Representatives at that time? I, I'm proud to say we worked on a bipartisan, balanced budget agreement. We so worked the with, that would we be worked Democrat with, or Republican? We worked with Republican, Republican leadership, leadership, but Republicans and much. Democrats can, in the Congress. Can you tell me, Director Lou, what the debt was in this country at the end of 2006? Um, I'd have to look that number up. I have a lot of numbers in my head. I don't, I I don't have that, that in my head. The debt at the end of 2006 when the Republicans uh, ended their control of Congress to the House of Representatives was $8.4 trillion. Would you say that was about right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 th when we took office, it was approaching $10 trillion. Oh, 8.4 when, 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 so, when Speaker yeah, Pelosi began so. her reign would be about right in 2007, correct? Yeah. And uh, the debt right now, uh, uh, Director Lou? The, the debt right now is that I can look it up. <laughs> About fourteen trillion. Fourteen trillion. Somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. So six about six trillion dollars in the last four years under Democrat leadership. Is that in, in the House? Is that yeah. correct? You know, I, I, I think that one can go through these numbers, numbers and I can look we can look up at the book and we can we can establish what the numbers are. I think one has to understand what was going on in a these absolutely, years. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were going through the worst economic conditions. I'll reclaim since my the Great time Depression. directly, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, wait, I only get four minutes. Um, and as as the elephant in the room has been discussed, it, it is a remarkable remarkable display that we believe is, has come out of the administration. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to, to uh, play kickball in the street or in the backyard, and when we turned around and headed to our house, we knew that the house was going to be there. The house is burning down, Mr. Director, and the fact of the matter is that the administration is playing kickball and not attending to the work that needs to be done. To, to put a budget before the American people that doesn't address the entitlement issue is reckless and irresponsible. And you talk about Quote, to get to balance, a set of decisions needs to be discussed that no one d is discussing right now. Well, I'll tell you who's discussing them, Mr. Director, and that's our constituents. They're scared to death, and they don't see any leadership coming out of this administration as it relates to the entitlements. When does that discussion begin? 
You know, Congressman, um, if, if you look at what's going on during the period... When, uh, Mr. Director, when does that discussion begin? I, I'm happy to answer your question if you give me a moment. I, I've got four minutes, and the fact of the matter is that you, that you are not answering the question, and you haven't answered the, the question. The President's put down a budget that we think takes the first and very important step of showing how we get to a sustainable deficit by the middle of the decade. That's that is an important step. And the President's also said that we need to work together on a bipartisan basis to do what we need to do in the long term, and I think we can't confuse the two issues. Does this, does this budget deal with the entitlements that uh, issue this, that, this that budget bankrupting the country? This budget begins to, but those entitlement issues did not cause the increases that you've just described. The worst economic recession since the Great Depression drove those numbers. Mr. We Director, need to get the economy moving, you know. and we need to take the steps that we've put forward in this budget, and then more on a bipartisan basis, working together. We look forward to that. As you well know, and as you've stated here, this, this budget does not deal with the entitlement issues. I want to turn my attention very quickly to, to the tax issues. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, y this, y the assumptions under this budget assume that the tax I increases will occur for those making more than $250,000 in two years. Is that correct? It assumes that the tax rates that are in current law will remain in effect. So that, so that a tax increase for small businesses occurs within this budget window, is that correct? It means that individuals, families that are earning over, over $250,000 a year will pay the same taxes that they did uh, during the, you know, at, at the end of the 90s when the economy was growing at the fastest and the, rate. And, it and didn't the amount of tax increase in this budget is about $1.6 trillion, is that correct? Um, you know, uh, again, I guess this question of measurement, I, I, I've tried to be very clear that there's a portion that we're not taking credit for because it's in the baseline, and I'm happy to work through those thank numbers you, with you. We already established the 1.6 number. Uh, Mr. Tonka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Liu, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Chair, excuse me. Did What happened to me? I just want to know. Ms. Ms. Moore, um, as you know, the rule is in the order in which you show up. So we have oh. Tonka, Bass, Moore, Wasserman, Schultz, Ryan, and Blumenauer on your side of the aisle. Okay, I just wanted to, to make sure I hadn't disappeared. <laughs> no, you're still there, Gwen. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for providing insight on the, uh, the President's uh, proposed budget. Uh, I also am aware that you're a fellow New Yorker. Uh, last month, members of uh, the New York delegation in the House, uh, myself included, wrote to you about extending the federal state health reform partnership. Um, as you know, this innovative partnership uh, between New York and the federal government has led to significant modernizations and improvements to our several hospitals and health systems. Established by former Governor Pataki and Secretary Levitt to improve New York's um, outdated health care system. The funds have been allocated already, but not all the projects have uh, been authorized by uh, the agreement uh, have been finished. Uh, the New York delegation also wrote to urge you and Secretary Sebelius to extend the waiver for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and my concern is that that be agreed to here. Uh, it's a common sense thing to do, and uh, do you know um, if OMB extends the waiver uh, be before it expires uh, late this year? Uh, Congressman, I know it's under review. Um, there are actually two waivers that are under review. Uh, uh, I've been at OMB for eight weeks. It's one of the things that I've actually looked at. It hasn't come to me for a decision yet. Um, we will continue to work with the state as we review it. Great. Uh, we look forward to working with you on that. And also, the President's budget, I'm very concerned about the investment in R&D and basic research. Uh, and happy to note that the President's budget proposes to invest some $148 billion in R&D, um, in energy efficiency, and key basic research. Um, uh, contrasted with the Republican spending plan that would slash R&D, uh, the President's budget also proposes robust investments in the National Institute of Health, where doctors and scientists work to cure cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, and other diseases that together claim the lives of millions of Americans every year are also impacted by that budgeting. Uh, the GOP spending plan on the floor today cuts NIH's budget by about a billion. Uh, and medical research has proven to extend life expectancy, for instance, from 50 years in 1911 to nearly 80 years now in 2011. Um, can you explain the, the approach taken with R&D and research, um, basic research in the President's plan? Um, some call it spending, others reference it as investing. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, we, we have uh, taken a very close look at the R&D budget, and we've looked 
kind of beyond some of the traditional boundaries, there's been a broad consensus that biomedical research is important. We agree with that. We have an increase uh, in biomedical research. But we've looked at areas like energy research, and we've put significant resources into developing the technologies that will make us the most competitive country uh, it, w with the technologies of the future. Uh, we put money into basic research. I think that we, we have to have a comprehensive research agenda uh, in order for us to be in a place where, as the President says, we can out-innovate other countries. It's been an area, historically, of enormous strength in the United States. T even today, we spend more as a country, public and private combined, on research than any other country in the world. There are certain aspects of it which don't happen in the private sector alone because there's too much risk, there's too, much, uh, the, too many experiments and things that aren't going to become commercially viable, but you need to go through that process in order to get the material, the knowledge out there. And I think we've had a history of very effective partnership in this country of transferring research from government-funded research to private sector development. And we've tried to put together a budget that will continue that, what we think is the best of the American tradition. Thank you. Mr. McClintock. Uh, Mr. Liu, uh, welcome. Um, I, I want to join Ms. Castor and others for complimenting you on the job you did under the Clinton administration. You guys did an absolutely magnificent job uh, uh, managing the, the nation's uh, uh, fiscal affairs. Uh, you cut spending by a miraculous 4% of GDP during your years, uh, 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 historic uh, reform of entitlements, ending welfare as we know it, uh, what amounted to the biggest capital gains tax cut in American history, four years of budget surpluses. It's true it was a Republican Congress, but give credit where credit is due. You guys did a great job. But I look at this budget, and it seems to be exactly the opposite. I wanted to just say thank you. <laughs> well, you're, no, no. With all sincerity, thank you. It was a great job. But I look at this budget, and it's exactly the opposite. Record increases in spending. Biggest peacetime <laughs> deficit in American history. No effort to address entitlements, which have grown significantly more challenging over the last several years. Wouldn't you call this the anti-Clinton budget? Uh, no, Congressman. I, I'm very proud of the work I did in, in the Clinton administration. Um, and I'd point out that the, one of the reasons that spending was falling as a percentage of GDP is the economy was growing so fast because we had a good fiscal policy that promoted confidence in economic growth. I think if you look at the projections uh, today, uh, spending now and in the future, we're projecting the retirement of the baby boom. Uh, we're seeing more people become 65 and claiming their benefits. Actually, that's my very next question. I want to get to your long-range projections. And, and, and I think that it is part of the reality of projections that even if we cut spending in the policies that we're making, as we pay the benefits that people are due, there will be areas of the budget where spending goes up. I don't think any of us would want to be saying that people shouldn't be able to collect their Social Security benefits when they're 65. But that, that and Medicare for people retiring is really driving those aggregate spending levels. On the discretionary side, we're cutting spending. Well, exactly right, which is why we're all baffled that you haven't uh, tackled entitlements that are, that are driving our long-range projections right off a cliff. But speaking of those long-range projections, I look at, at, at the claims that, uh, that you're reducing the deficit in the long term. You know, we, we have enough trouble projecting 10 quarters into the future without projecting 10 years. But I look at what you're doing here, and you take the current year's war funding uh, level of $165 billion this year <coughs> to pay for operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, including the surge. Uh, you then take this level and project it out for 10 years and this represents your current uh, policy baseline. Uh, you then uh, assume a policy uh, or placeholder of $50 billion for the war from, uh, uh, from 2013 to 2021, and then you count the lower funding in your budget relative to this current policy baseline as a $1.1 trillion spending cut over 10 years. You take the related debt service, that's another $1.3 trillion. Are you guys really planning to stay in Iraq at current levels uh, and to continue the surge for the next 10 years? No, uh, uh, the no, budget. No, it, it, does it yes or no question, yes or no? No, the budget reflects our withdrawal from Iraq. And, 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 uh, yeah, and, and, and you're claiming that as savings. You take a baseline well, assuming of $165 billion a year, including the surge, and then you count uh, uh, everything below that as, as savings. Well, we're planning to do that anyway. No, I'm, I'm happy to respond. We're almost out of time. Um, the, the, the overseas contingency operation account 
is something that really solved a problem that the Obama administration inherited, which was there was no orderly way to fund uh, war operations. And supplemental appropriations were very uh, much in dis you know, repute as being a way of uh, not having got, uh, honest budgeting. In the five seconds I've got left, I think that's an intellectually dishonest way of presenting the budget, particularly when the other part is $819 billion of tax increase. There's an important issue, and I would love to be able to respond uh, in more in detail writing? on it. How about in writing, because I'd love to hear the answer to that one, too. Um, Ms. Bass. Thank you. Um, Director Liu, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You and the President should be commended for crafting a $1.1 trillion deficit-cutting budget that strikes the right balance, frankly, between spending reductions and targeted investments in infrastructure, innovation, and education. Uh, prior to Congress, I served in the California legislature where we had to make tough choices such as eliminating Pell Grants for summer school to sustain the maximum award for all eligible students. Having said that, I do want to take a moment to draw attention to the choices made in the continuing resolution that will be debated this week. Not only does the spending plan make devastating cuts to critical programs families depend on to get back on their feet, but the continuing resolution would result in lost jobs of 1,300 police officers, 2,400 firefighters, and 16,000 private sector construction jobs from cutting $1.7 billion from the Federal Building Fund. Um, the most promising new source of economic growth and job creation is in our public infrastructure system from roads and bridges to broadband and air traffic control systems to a new energy grid. I'm pleased to see that the budget invests in these key areas that will spur job creation. And based on this, uh, what do you believe are the potential numbers of jobs that would be created by what you and the President are proposing? Um, Congressman, I thank you. I, I can't give you a specific job uh, <laughs> forecast. Uh, I think we've all learned that there's uh, there's uh, uncertainty in the in the projections when you get to a pinpoint number. I think what we know is that um, that when you build roads, when you build ports, when you build the infrastructure we need to be competitive in the future, it puts men and women to work on those projects in real time. And in our surface transportation reauthorization proposal. We do propose that $50 billion be done at the beginning to head, get a head start and to get people to work. Um, I'd be happy to kind of get back to you with some notions of what that means in terms of specific jobs, but it's clearly a lot of jobs. I, I would appreciate that. If you, even if you could give us a range, yeah. if you could get back to me, I would appreciate that. Uh, second question, um, with the cuts that are taken in the defense part of the budget, uh, I do believe that we can find additional savings. And I wanted to ask you, for example, uh, as I understand it, there's nearly 270 bases in Germany 65 years after World War II ended. And I wanted to know if the administration has conducted a savings estimate on closing these bases uh, that probably no longer serve a strategic value. And if some of them do, I, I would question whether over 200 do. You know, I, I think that these are the kinds of questions the Department of Defense needs to ask, not just about Europe, but about its operations everywhere. What do we need for our current <coughs> and future defense? What could we live without? I don't want to prejudge the answers to any of those questions, but I think that by putting in this budget the first step to bringing the Department of Defense back into the, the, the kind of normal budget trade-offs where we're saying no real growth. That is a cut in terms of what you can buy. It means you have to start doing less things. That's a step in the direction of asking a lot of very hard questions. Thank you. And then just finally, uh, I wanted to thank you for your comments earlier, especially about the R&D uh, credit. Uh, you know, being in California in the Silicon Valley, that's, we hear that all the time from the tech community, the need for that to be long term so that they can do the planning. So thank you very much thank for you. your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. D Director, thank you for being here and your good work. I, I do appreciate it, um, uh, the work you've done in the past. But what I have a problem with is this budget. It was suggested earlier that uh, budgets reflect the priorities and values of those that present them. And I think in this case it's true. I think it's very true that this is a, a case that's being made by the administration. They want big government, more government. The bottom line is this doubles the debt in 10 years, and that it's fiscally irresponsible. You know, the decisions we make in Congress are all about are we gonna, what kind of money are we going to pull out of people's pockets and give to somebody else. 
and I find it, re find it reprehensible that we continue to talk about investments and other things when we're pulling people from people's pulling money from people's pockets to try to give it to somebody else. The most important thing we can do is allow money to stay in, in their own pocket. It's the American people's money. It's not Congress's money. It's not the White House's money. I, I want to I get very specific on some of the things you said. This budget is a down payment was one of the things I, I, I heard a quote from you, I believe, yesterday. This is a down payment on mortgaging our future, and it exac exacerbates the problem, doesn't actually solve it. I want to talk about part of your testimony on page six. It says, quote, to stay on a path towards sustainable deficits. Sustainable deficits seems like an oxymoron to me. You know, we're, we're on a trajectory where we can't afford anything. We're paying $600 million a day just in interest. I would appreciate at a future date to please try to define for us sustainable deficits because I think to the average American, to me, it does not make sense. We have no sustainable deficits. To further go on with that quote, you say, on the order of 3% of GDP, we make tough choices across all areas of the budget to identify more than $1 trillion in savings, two-thirds from spending reductions. Where does that other third come from? As I understand it, it's from tax increases, is it not? I'm happy to answer all the questions you just asked. Just this last one, please. I know our time is short. Uh, the, the net savings come from a number of provisions, but a lot of it comes from the provision that would pay for the alternative minimum tax, which would reduce the value of tax deductions for people who families at 215 and above. And a significant portion does come from tax increases, correct? Well, a third. A third uh, yeah. is coming from tax increase. You have a statement in here about fe uh, federal civilian pay employee pay freeze. I find this to be terribly disingenuous. The reality is when Barack Obama took office to now, we have 145,000 additional federal workers. To suggest that pay is being frozen is not an accurate statement. Through step increases, through bonuses, through others, we have dramatically increased the federal payroll. The budget that is being proposed, when you say pay freeze, does that mean that expenditures on payroll will go up or stay the same? It means that uh, people are not going to get a cost of living adjustment, a, ba a raise from the pay that they get right now. Well, so the, the total, the line item for, the, for the going forward, over the, will, will our total expenditure from the U.S. government, will that go up or will that be the same? Well, if we have more people, uh, we will obviously have to pay the people who we're hiring. But for an individual federal worker, no, uh, but they're, that's, they're that's going to see their pay frozen. I guess what I'm worried about for the, for the American taxpayer is their expense for federal employees is going to go up, correct? Well, I think if we want people to work at the airports and check to see the bombs aren't getting on planes, we have to pay them. And, TSA agents. But we have new How technology, and the new technology requires TSA people to use you it. You have 65,000 TSA Congressman, agents. Congressman, I'm happy to go into detailed answers. How many more TSA agents do you need? I think as we put new technology at the airports, uh, we needed to hire people to work that equipment. I can get you an exact number. You have 65,000. Yeah. I, I need to know how many more people yeah. is it going to take? I th know that it's not worth buying equipment that we don't have people to operate. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I'd love to answer your other questions if I have time. I don't know I, if I have time. I, it, if you could get to the gentleman in writing only because we yeah. want to you know, watch your time and, sure. and the, the rest of the members' time. Yep. Um, uh, it's now my pleasure <laughs> to yield time to Ms. Moore. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Lou, for appearing. And as you can tell, members on both sides of the aisle are very frustrated because this is a very difficult uh, budget. Uh, and uh, brr, coming from a cold place like Wisconsin, <laughs> it is just chilling to see things cut like the low-income housing energy assistance program, for example. But I do appreciate the fact that the administration has attempted to have somewhat of a balance um, in terms of, of, of revenue and spending cuts and defense cuts and, um, and entitlement cuts. I just want to ask you a very simple question. If we cut every dime of discretionary non-defense spending, would that put us on a, a course toward ending our deficits? We it spent every single dime. It, it, it's not a big enough part of the budget for us to, to solve you. the problem. That's, that's what I want to know because uh, there is an attempt um, to really describe the solution as simply just cutting everything, mm. not just low-income heating assistance, but everything. everything yeah. um, in, in entitlements, my questions are generated from just listening here today. I get a little bit nervous when my colleagues talk about 
the that the White House uh, not having dealt with entitlements. Didn't you say earlier in your testimony that you had found what was it, sixty-five billion? Sixty-two billion dollars in yeah. savings from Medicare. So it's Medicare, Medicaid, federal employees, health benefit programs. It's okay, dozens so, of different provisions. So thank you. So you did in fact deal with entitlements. Uh, the reason I get nervous is because entitlements is a really big category. The Medicare prescription drug program. Can you remind me? Of how much that cost and was not paid for. Well, I can tell uh, you, none of, got here. none of it was paid for. The exact estimate at the time um, was on the order of five hundred billion dollars. Five hundred uh, billion dollars. I, I wasn't working on this at the time. I might have the number and I, wrong. I I'm wasn't happy to here, check. And, yeah. and and Democrats weren't in control control of Congress. That's an entitlement that needs reforming. Social Security. I get very nervous, you know, because I can you just clarify for me who pays for Social Security? It comes out of our paychecks and employers' paychecks, uh, is and you said earlier it was not driving the deficit. Why do they keep lumping Social Security into to this uh, deficit uh, uh, situation that we're in, and saying that it needs to be dealt with? Well, so Social Security is financed by payroll tax, half by the employer, half by the employee. And if you look at the Social Security Trust Fund, it is projected to remain in a position to pay benefits until 2037. So we don't have any immediate crisis in Social Security funding. I think that the, you know, it's also the case that we're spending more year to year on Social Security because people are retiring. If you turn 65, you get benefits. Okay, so thank you. I hate to cut you off, but I, no, time is limited. Uh, I keep hearing an awful lot about how, you got, how the White House is harming small businesses, the business creators. I'm just wondering, what are, you, what are you talking about? These one person, if I have a hedge fund, operating from my living room with a computer and I'm a small business and I make, you know, a couple, you know, several million dollars. Am I considered a small business, a job creator? Like you said, law firms. Who are these small businesses that we're harming? Well, with the, with the, with the tax. I think payment. if you look at the budget proposals we have, we have targeted assistance for small businesses that meet the kind of definition that I think most of us would in a common sense way think of a small business, a small factory, a small sh a shop. Um, and it wouldn't apply to services like law and finance. So we have we have incentives that are in, we propose that would make the tax code so you've more differentiated attractive. here, yeah. so that you know we're, it's not we, the ma pa shop. Right. We, we don't need to to have the overall tax rate on the wealthiest Americans uh, go back down to okay, the. Okay, let same me ask level. one final question in my last five seconds, or just to make a statement, maybe. maybe. The the Bush era tax cuts, which I think we ought to have gotten rid of, period. The, those earning over $250,000 a year still benefit six times as much as everybody else. Thank, thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, Ms. Black. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Liu. Um, I want to go back and continue in the vein of the question related to um, a sustainable deficit. Um, you started out by saying that this budget is just a starting point. Um, I'm a little disappointed in that because my understanding is that as the role of the president, um, he is to set forth a plan, not a skeleton. So I'm disappointed that there wasn't more of a plan here along the areas of the um, entitlement programs, but that's really not the direction I want to go. The direction that I want to go in is talking about sustainable deficits. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as has already been said here, we admire the work that you did during the Clinton administration and particularly having a budget surplus and um, that it broke your heart that we are not in that situation. However, it seems as I read your testimony and what I hear today that the goal here was to have a sustainable deficit. And I think our goal should be to be out of debt and that we shouldn't have a sustainable deficit, but we should have a balanced budget. Um, do you agree that we should be in a situation where we're not, our goal should not be a sustainable deficit, but should be that we would have a surplus and not spend more money than what we uh, bring in? The reason we call this a down payment is because we do agree that we need to get beyond uh, stopping the building up of the debt, and we then need to work on surplus so we can pay it down. The problem is you don't get there quickly. You, you have to stop putting more onto the bill before you can pay it down. It's going to take hard work to do that. The 3% of GDP gets us only to the point where we're paying our current bills with revenue, and we still have the deficit, the, the long-term debt out there. And then we're going to need to work together on dealing with that. And I want to go to that, too, because if our goal over the next 10 years is to just have sustainable deficit, 
will never pay down the debt. And frankly, um, one of the reasons why I ran is mm -hmm. because I look at my six grandchildren and I'm really sad to think that my goal over the next 10 years or my goal of serving for however long I serve is just to sustain the deficit and not go toward the debt. And I think that it's short-sighted for us to think along those lines. I, I, I want to see a plan. Uh, yeah. I want to see a plan that gets rid of the deficit and begins to start to pay on the debt. You know, I think that uh, having presented budgets that had surpluses and now working on a budget that's a tough budget that st stops building the debt, I agree that we need to look beyond getting to the point where we're not adding to the debt, and we need to look to the point where during good economic times we're paying down the debt. We just can't make, it's not a simple process. We're not going to get there quickly. It took a long time to dig this hole. It took a lot of decisions to get us where we are. It's going to take a lot of hard work to get out. And I think that the, the notion that this is a starting point, I don't mean to say it's not a serious po starting point. It is a comprehensive, responsible budget. The president doesn't get the final word. He gets the first word. He's put his plan forward. But I want to go back to get, again to words that you used on one of the other uh, comments that you made. Uh, and you talked about all of the things that got us to where we are. But you said the number one thing was we suspended common sense spending where we are spending more than what we bring in. And this budget that we have gotten does the same thing. And I don't think it gets us to where our goal really should be, and that is to stop deficit spending and start paying down our debt. Well, this budget actually s uh, adheres to the principle that we need to pay for what we do. And uh, with all respect, I would note that changing the rules of the House so that tax cuts don't require uh, offsets is not something that's going to help get to the goal that you're looking for. We need to have a clear-headed an understanding that whether it's a tax cut or spending increase, if we don't pay for it, it increases the deficit. Well, the more that we take from the people that are out there creating the jobs, the less jobs we'll have and the less taxes we'll collect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome. Good, good, to, good be to see here. you. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting that the gentlelady from Tennessee laments the lack of a plan. Um, here it is. This looks like a plan to me. Um, this Felt like a plan putting it together. <laughs> I, I bet it did. Uh, this, this from the party that still after six weeks in the 112th Congress still has no jobs agenda, still has not put forward a plan to create jobs, not a single piece of legislation, nothing that uh, has as many pages as this, uh, 207 pages like this, like this plan does. Uh, so um, I think that, uh, that when, when casting aspersions about the lack of a plan, they should look inward first. Um, but your testimony re referred to $62 billion in savings from increasing efficiency and accountability of health spending. Um, now, we really focused on cracking down on waste, fraud, and abuse, and that was a huge priority in the 111th Congress for Democrats, particularly when we uh, passed the Affordable Care Act. Um, what are some of the significant policies in the budget that will contribute to that kind of saving? Congressman, there's, uh, there's kind of three baskets of savings. Uh, there's one set, which is about 16 provisions, which uh, we would call program integrity. It's to make sure that if a provider has been paid erroneously, we recoup payment. Um, if a provider submits bills for things that shouldn't be paid or duplicate bills, we have a process to make sure we pay once and we pay properly. Uh, and that saves about a little over $30 billion. Uh, we then have a number of provisions that would give Medicare and Medicaid the ability to take advantage of uh, generic drugs, particularly uh, generic biologics. That saves a little over $10 billion. And then we have a couple of changes in the Medicaid program, uh, one of which would, would make sure that when we have expanded coverage and less uncompensated care, we calibrate correctly the disproportionate share payments that are supposed to pay providers who are providing uncompensated care. And then there's another that just lines up the state payment rates so that there's accuracy in what they're being matched for. It, it, the $62 billion of the savings to which I, I just referred, is that separate and distinct from the $125 billion in savings included in the budget related to program integrity? Um, it's only counted in the budget once, <laughs> and uh, it is uh, in the mandatory section is $62 billion. We may have a display that shows it somewhere else, but it's only in the numbers once. Thank you. Um, just I want to focus on the cuts in community development block grants. Um, 
In recent years, Congress has typically provided more than the President requests for CDBG. Um, and that's obviously a program that helps local governments fund housing and sewers and streets and economic development, particularly in low and moderate income neighborhoods. I mean, uh, let me just give you a couple of examples of this for folks that really don't know. Uh, congressional speak, you know, CDBG funds things like three grants in 2010 to the cities of Janesville, Kenosha, and Racine, Wisconsin, totaling nearly $4 million, and $2.4 million in two grants to Lima and Mansfield, Ohio. Um, so my question is, the, the, the President's 2012 budget cuts CDBG by about $646 million, and that's compared to the CR, where the Republican cuts it 3.1 billion below, from, from the CR, $2.4 billion below the President's. Um, can you classify the distinction between the President's approach to CDB, CDBG cuts and the cuts in the CR from the, the Republican? The President's budget is a comprehensive budget where we made tough trade-offs. Reducing community development block grants by 7.5% is a tough decision. We've got a lot of cities and towns that do good work with this money. Uh, but we, made, we didn't think it was necessary to make a deeper cut than that to hit the target of the $400 billion savings. Thank you, Mr. A chisel Mr. rather I'm than I'm sorry, a just in the interest of time, I'm now Thank you. gentleman from Appleton, Wisconsin, Mr. Ribble. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Lou, for being here today. Um, just reading out of your, um, your testimony on page five, you say, not that the country is back from the brink of potential economic collapse, I, I would dare say that there's about 10 million Americans who wouldn't agree with that because they don't have a job today. Our goal is to win the future, but we cannot do so if we are saddled with increasingly growing deficits. Do you believe that statement or was it just put in there as hyperbole? No, I believe it. I think that we were in a, in a state of free fall in the economy. Um, we're not content with unemployment where it is now or growth where it is now, but we've gone from negative growth and losing jobs to positive growth and creating jobs. And I believe that if we don't deal with the deficit, it is going to become a real threat to our economy. Right. So we, we cannot win the future if we're saddled with increasingly growing deficits. That's a statement that you agree yeah, with. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Well, then I why? wrote it, and I agree with it. Good. <laughs> then why, then it's a good thing. <laughs> why would the president project a budget that for the last five years, whose deficits are 800, uh, $890 billion, $891 billion, $960 billion, 1.05 trillion and 1.16 trillion, all growing deficits. I think if you look at these last few years, uh, it, there have been extraordinary things going on because of the recession. Uh, we've had a collapse in terms of revenues because of lower economic activity. We've had increased expenditures, uh, some of them automatic stabilizers, some of them actions Congress and we took together to get the economy moving again. And we've said that we're now at a pivot point. We cannot accept that as business as usual. It was necessary during the recession. We had to get out of this recession. If we were seeing negative growth right now and rising unemployment, that would be a terrible thing. So I think we, we are very proud of the work we did. We inherited an economy that was not in good shape. We've gotten it on the path towards being in much better shape. The job's not done. And we're now looking to the future, and that's why we put together a budget that we think invests in the future. Yeah, but the first five years, you project decreasing deficits. And the last five years, you project increasing deficits, which will prevent us from winning the future. I think the deficit as a percentage of the economy stays in that 3% range in the entire period of this budget. And that is what we need to do to be able to pay our bills and not to put our current expenses on the credit card. We're going to have to do a lot more to pay down the debt. We are. Th and we're not pretending that we can do that all at once. We need to do that together. But we've got to get started. Yeah, on, on page seven, you use the, uh, it'd be short-sighted to cut spending across the board and shortchange critical areas for growth and competitive, competitiveness such as education, innovation, and infrastructure, or carelessly slash programs that protect the most vulnerable. It's a little incendiary to think that those are the only two choices, but maybe it wasn't written with that intent. Uh, I, I will tell you that I, what I believe is careless. When all the adults in this room leave, cameras are gone and the television announcers go home. I believe there's going to be a five-year-old sitting here with a bill. I think that's careless. Thank you, sir. Just saved 42 seconds for <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ryan.
There we go. Um, thank you, Mr. Liu. I think this is the best budget you could put together given the circumstances. And I think it's important for us to remember that it was the president and this administration that said we need to have a debt commission that made that happen while a lot of Republicans on the other side were doing the Potomac two-step backpedaling away from it. And I think we need to go back and read those uh, press clippings. You were here in 1993. Um, would you say that 1993 budget when we had great economic growth during the 90s, 20 plus million new jobs being created, was it the 93 budget that really got the economy back on track? Congressman, you know, I, I would say that what really made a difference was that from 1990 under President Bush to 1993 under President Clinton to 1997 when there was a bipartisan budget agreement, we showed continued emphasis on reducing the deficit and paying for what we were doing and getting our economic house in order. 1990 and 1997 were bipartisan, 1993 was not. Uh, I hope that we're now going back into a period where we can work together because I actually believe that people draw a false distinction between is the economy causing us to get out of the, the deficit or is it our policies? They're, they're connected. When we pursue policies that promote confidence in the future, it's good for the economy. When the economy grows, it's good for the deficit, well, a I virtuous think, cycle. I think it's important that we realize that mature decisions were made in 1990, mature decisions were made right. in 1993. In 1993, there wasn't one Republican that voted for that budget. Uh, Vice President Gore had to break the tie in 1993. And then when we got into the 90s, we had some money to invest in children's health care and, and research and development and set the stage for uh, TCOM revolution and the internet revolution and everything else. Two quick questions. One is, um, is there a concern of yours? We got a hundred billion in cuts that our friends in the House uh, want to make um, immediately in the next few months. We've got about 140 to 150 billion in cuts uh, being made by states uh, across the country. Uh, Two billion is going to be pulled out from the federal employees. Are you concerned that in the short term that we are pulling too much money uh, out of the economy and it is going to hurt our, our, the growth that we've had and the success that you've had over the last year or two? We've put together a budget that uh, tries to you know, step on the brakes at the right time and to, and to not jump too fast into uh, fiscal consolidation. Um, I, I, I think we're going to have to look and see how the debate develops here in Congress. I think there is a concern in the states as they're facing their fiscal challenges. Um, we were careful in this budget that overall the impact on the states um, it, we don't think will create more of a problem there, though there are some things that we reduce, there are other things we increase. I'm concerned you guys have a veto pen and I just want to encourage you to not be afraid to take a stand because we've come a long way in the last two years and we need the president to continue to lead us out of this. We're, we're doing the right things now. I disagree with what my friends on the other side are saying and that leads me to my next and final question and you've got 35 <laughs> seconds to try to sum it up. How do these investments that you're making, R&D, uh, education, uh, high-speed rail infrastructure, how do these investments compare as a percent of the GDP to what China's doing, what Germany's doing, what some of these other countries are pumping money into? How do our investments compare to these other countries as we try to be competitive and compete? Well, overall, the United States, as an the private public combined has spends more money on research and development than the next four largest countries put together. So we're the leaders in R&D. I think in these areas, we frankly have not kept up with some of our competitors. The infrastructure investment needs to keep up in order to be able to ship goods and buy and sell goods. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Liu, for uh, joining us today. I want to continue the conversation that uh, Mr. Price started about amnesia regarding the past. Uh, do you recall what the unemployment was, rate was in December of 2006? It was about 4.4 percent. The unemployment rate in December of 2010 was in the mid nines. Uh, I would submit that the legislative, the pro what you had, you claimed that you inherited was due to a legislative process that occurred during that four-year period, and that wasn't controlled on this side of the aisle. Uh, I'm new to this job. I've been in it about six weeks. Uh, before I did this, I was a CPA and a CFO and a CEO for a number of successful companies. And so I know what it's like to sign the front side of a paycheck, to make the decision to commit to hire an employer to make an investment. This so-called plan doesn't put me in a position, if I were in that chair today, to do that. Uh, 
The other thing is that I've learned some interesting, I know a little bit about businesses and budgeting and, and uh, I've learned some new terminology. Sustainable deficits is a new term and then uh, primary balance, that's another interesting term. Uh, when Chairman Bernanke was here last week, he said that the federal deficit over the long term should not exceed the interest cost that we pay on our debt. Uh, we have come up with this definition of primary balance that it's okay to run a deficit of 3% of GDP. How many businesses and families do you know of that can operate in primary balance and for how long? We haven't set the goal of stopping at primary balance. We've said you have to get to primary balance in order to get beyond that. And I think it's an important difference. This doesn't get better than primary balance. You, you're not going to get to balance if you don't pass through primary balance. The other, let me submit to you that most families and most businesses that I know of cannot operate in primary balance. I commend you for having balanced budgets during the Clinton administration. That's what I call primary balance, is where you have zero deficit or a surplus. The question I have is... If, if I could just respond uh, on the first point, you know, I think most families uh, have had some experience with building up balances on their credit card that they really were facing really hard decisions. But they don't do it over 10 years. No, they, they don't do it they over start, 10 years. They start by cutting up the card, not putting more on it. And right. that's what primary balance is. They start by cutting their, ex their net deficit to zero, and this plan doesn't do that. My questions are this. Uh, you've got average spending uh, during, what was it? Let me rephrase that. What I'm going to have to bring historical statistics with me the next time I testify. Well, I can answer <laughs> it for you, but if, do you recall what spending was as a percent of GDP during the Clinton administration? Uh, it was around 20%. Uh, Correct. And what is the average spending as a percent of GDP under this plan? You know, I, I think that uh, when you look at spending as a percentage of GDP over time, it does grow as the population grows because people become eligible for Social Security and Medicare. So uh, it, when one talks about those numbers, you have to look at what's behind them. And not, not all spending... It's 23%. And uh, if we really wanted to develop a plan that was on uh, what I, to have sustainable deficits of zero or primary balance of zero, we should have spending down around the same level as taxes, and that's around 18.3 percent of GDP over the long term. You don't I get the balance, and you don't get the balance if your revenue and your spending don't cross. The question is at what level they cross, providing what we need for the country. I understand. I yield back. Ms. Kaffer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Liu. Uh, each yeah. member of Congress arrives here from different life experiences, and one truth in our family is going back nearly a century that when Republicans occupied the White House and Congress, members of our family were thrown out of work. And when Democrats regained those offices, our family members started going back to work. It's one of the reasons I am a Democrat. I know until all Americans who want to work are able to become productive again, we won't be able to balance our budget nor reduce the deficit. No American I know wants to borrow more money from China or any other foreign country to keep this economy afloat. The administration budget, in my opinion, makes a responsible start and takes the deficit seriously, and so do I. In fact, I have served in this Congress long enough to have been a part of the solution during the 1990s that some of my Republican colleagues have referenced to balance the budget and grow jobs in this economy. Mr. Liu, you are a part of that. I think the President has the right man uh, in your you. position. Also this man, Mr. Panetta, who now heads the CIA. We sat in this room. I was a member of the Budget Committee back then. I know what we did for America. And when we did it, Alan Greenspan said he didn't think it was a good idea to balance the budget. That is the most unbelievable statement I ever heard in my life. Congress did it by making tough choices by cutting waste and also curbing special interests. I support the administration's proposals to get rid of those oil subsidies. Let them compete in the global economy. In the tough times we are facing today, due to the Wall Street abuses that caused the recession we are in, uh, the problem with the Republican budget is it hurts job creation. And it goes after the people who can least afford to hold their lives together in this economy. In fact, their budget cuts off almost 4 million student loans. It takes away 5 million meals to the homebound elderly. It lays off meat and poultry inspectors. And it cuts 40,000 jobs in preschools and Head Start. I don't think that's a very good set of proposals. So my questions, really, Mr. Liu, to you, deal with jobs, which is where we should be focused in two areas, one transportation and the other one energy. 
for where I come from, which is not a government platform like capital cities like the one we're sitting in right now, and it's not a trading virtual platform like New York or Chicago or San Francisco, these places that deal in virtual stuff. We are the real economy in northern Ohio, and for us, transportation and energy are destiny. So let me ask you, uh, the administration has put some focus in its budget, despite tough times, on investing in infrastructure and also in new forms of energy. That is music to our ears in our part of the country. We have to compete in an unsubsidized free enterprise economy in northern Ohio. Could you please tell us a little bit about the investments that the administration is going to be making in transportation and in renewable energy and how this will contribute to job creation, which we all desperately want? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kaptur. I'm I'm going to try in 50 seconds to do justice to our program. We have a, a pro, a, an approach that's uh, designed to make sure that we build the infrastructure so that we can have goods come and go between American markets and shipped internationally uh, from our seaports and our airports. We've taken a broad view of surface transportation because it also means having the kind of T internet, the, the modern communications uh, technology so that Northern Ohio becomes part of the virtual economy because there's no part of the country that's left behind. That's what it's going to take to win the future. In R&D and energy, you know, we look at the new technologies in renewable energy and where other countries are frankly putting their money down saying that's the future. If we don't do the same, we're going to find ourselves, you know, left behind. America's never been left behind before and we shouldn't start now. I wish you could say more. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lou. Uh, Mr. Mulvaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lou, I'm also am one of the folks who's new around here, but I think I'm familiar with budgets. I've, I've written them, uh, I've read them, and I can assure you, sir, that if you let me play around with the assumptions, I can make you uh, a, a budget that looks as good or as bad as I want it to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at your uh, assumptions regarding the revenues in the future, and uh, you've assumed essentially that revenues will become about 19% of GDP in the next couple of years and then steadily increase over the course of your budget, peaking out above 20 percent. This is the historical numbers uh, going back to the 1960s, and I suggest to you, sir, that or I would ask you, are, are you making an assumption that we've only seen once or twice in the last 40 years? You know, uh, the, the revenue projections are, are based on a combination of current law and specific proposals, um, and it's driven by what's happening in the economy overall. But the uh, truth of the matter is, and I hate to cut you off, but yeah. you recognize we're under a tight, a tight yeah. time here, is that you're assuming numbers that are, you're assuming the numbers will be average, 19%, 19%, 20%, and we've only seen that sporadically once, maybe twice in the last 40 years. Right. You take a look at the GDP, uh, another one of your assumptions, Mr. Ryan mentioned it earlier, the Washington Post beat you up on it today. Um, you're assuming uh, rates of growth in the economy that dramatically exceed even what the CBO is, is, is assuming. Against that backdrop, you are also assuming interest rates dramatically lower than the CBO. I would suggest to you, sir, that to assume growth rates that are higher, but interest rates that are lower is internally inconsistent. And I, I draw your attention to the fact that you've, uh, you've assumed uh, an interest rate on the 10-year Treasury note of this year of 3%. Do you know what the 10-year uh, traded at last week? Um, I did not check the T-bill rates last week. 3.65. And your assumption is that it'll be 3% this year. The CBO, by the way, says it'll be 3.4. They're already too low. The CBO also testified that for every percentage point that they assume the interest rate is too low, it's $1.3 trillion of additional debt over the course of the 10 years. So you've assumed revenues that are, that are way higher than average, uh, GDP that is higher than anybody else thinks, and interest rates that are dramatically lower than anybody else thinks. And I put it to you, sir, that that is the reason that this is not a credible document. And I go back and I look at the past couple of budgets that the President has offered. Two years ago, he told us the deficit this year would be $900 billion in his budget. Last year, he told us the deficit this year would be $1.3 trillion. Yesterday, he told us it was 1.6. Two years ago, he told us he projected that the budget deficit next year would be 557. Last year, he told us that number was going to be 829. Now he's telling us the number is going to be 1.1. I can't believe the numbers. I can't do it, and until we can get numbers that we can agree on are at least in the middle of the assumptions, it's going to be very difficult for us to focus on policy. Is it a question? No, sir, it's not. Am I beating up on you? Perhaps unfairly so, but the point is this. 
we should be here talking about policy. We should be here talking yeah. about what the president wants to do to fix the country and what we want to do to fix the country. I happen to be one of those Republicans who does not believe the president doesn't want the country to succeed. Mm -hmm. I believe that he does, but we have to have a discussion about policy. And when you give us numbers that are simply not credible, it really prevents us from doing that. I, I Can I respond at least quickly? Uh, very briefly. Yeah. I expect better out of you. Yeah. And I've already talk, spoken to the chairman. I expect better from us. When you see our budget, you're not going to see unreasonable assumptions. But yes, Steve. Uh, the economic assumptions in this budget r reflect what is the middle in terms of where the Federal Reserve Board looks at what the likely patterns of recovery are. So there are mainstream assumptions. Well, you need to walk and to CBO and tell them that their numbers are whacked out. There is, a, there, there, is, there is a conceptual difference between the CBO numbers and ours where they believe the economy never gets back to the level of strength that it had before the recession. That hasn't been the experience of past recessions, even financially red led re recessions. It's taken longer, but we've gotten back. So there may be year-to-year -year disagreements, but we think we have very credible economic assumptions, and I'm happy when we have more time to go through them in some detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hillskamp. Hey, Mr. Hillskamp, will you just yield for 10 seconds? Yes, sir. Here's what we think is wrong. You're assuming 3.9% growth in the first five years, 3.2% over 10 years. That's above trend. And only with those rosy assumptions can you ever even get close to the primary balance you're claiming. That's why when we see blue chip, CBO, far below where you are, it sort of strains the credibility of these claims. That's the point we're trying to make. Mr. Chairman, I, I would just say that, that in the short term, we actually are slightly less optimistic. In the long term, we're slightly more optimistic because of the difference in, in approach in that I just medium described. Term where you hit your, your but, objectives, but you're much the, more up. The, th the, 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 the idea behind the economic projections is will we or won't we track the recovery patterns from past financially led recessions? We believe we will. And that's, that's what the projection is. So it is to that trend. Mr. Yieldskamp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director, I appreciate you being here. And uh, uh, back in February 23rd, 2009, the CBO at that time outlines a uh, $1.186 trillion deficit. And uh, the very next day, the President made his uh, promise to uh, pledge to cut the deficit in half by the end of my first term in office. And in your uh, comments and the comments of the President yesterday, he, he made a claim that he was going to meet that pledge, at least projected. Uh, but the numbers show uh, one half of uh, the CBO figures are uh, $593 mm -hmm. billion dollar deficit. Uh, what do you project? If, if you look at it as a percentage of GDP, uh, we cut it in half. Uh, by well, the end of the that was term. not the statement of the president. And th th that, a that's and what we're and that, That's what bothers me of uh, how the president can stand up and you can stand here in this document and claim that you're cutting the deficit in half when you did not. Well, we are not cutting it in half as a percentage of GDP. That was not the claim the president made. Would you agree with me? Um, I know what we've done in this budget. I know we've said in this budget we, uh, we, we cut the deficit in half by GDP uh, as a percentage of GDP, and uh, that's And I consistent. appreciate that. Again, yeah. I'll just note that is not what the president said, and that's uh, not uh, accurate of what's in your budget. And that's some of my difficulty, where I come from. I mean, if you're wrong, you're wrong. But to stand up and, again, make that claim, I, I was very disappointed in that particular claim. But I'm also particularly disappointed, uh, 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 Mr. Director, in, in another statement in your document and where you, uh, to quote, we're going to stay on a path towards sustainable deficits. And uh, how long are deficits sustainable? We need to get to the place where we stop adding to the national debt. And then this is a down payment. We need to work together to go farther than that. But you got to walk before you run. You've got to get I rid of but the deficit budget, before you cut the debt. This budget never does that, does it? For it, gets us on, it gets us on a path where we will be able to do it, yes. The path is unsustainable. Your path in this budget is unsustainable. We, I look forward to seeing a plan. I look forward to no, I, I, plan we're not talking about a proposed plan, yeah. Mr. Liu, and that's, that's what I'm dissatisfied because the language that's coming out of this administration is telling the American people that we can borrow for 10 years or longer and we're going to call it sustainable. We're going to say 3% borrowing is sustainable. It is not sustainable. There's no way we can s sustain the track that's being presented here. And that's disappointing because I know the American people. I know people that work every day and try to balance their budgets. And they understand that sometimes you go underwater a while. But to stand here today, sit here today and have the president claim somehow it'll be all okay, even if we're going to have a 768 billion dollar deficit in two years still there and we're going to sustain that forever 
And that's why I'm very disappointed. Well, the president it, didn't stand. I, I'm still talking here. Thank right. you. I'm very disappointed in that. That's what I wanted to convey here because okay. the president has the opportunity. He still does. He still has the opportunity to stand up and provide proposals to save and strengthen Medicare. And you've said here that those are not contained in here. Right. But I just want to note to the American people, the folks that are listening here and, and the media, this is not sustainable. You can call it whatever you want. Sustainable deficits do not work. Primary balance is a figment of our imagination. Only in Washington could you run a deficit and claim it's balanced and somehow use the word balance. Mr. Lou, you couldn't do that anywhere else. They'd laugh you out of the room. And I come at the state level. I serve in the state legislature. We had a requirement, really, balance. It wasn't a primary balance. We couldn't run a deficit. This country is on a course for unsustainability, and I would expect the president to stand forward and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to keep my word, but to stand up and tell the American people, I kept my pledge. He did not. He's I disagree with your Congressman. I time at answer. He is $193 billion off of his promise. That's a false claim, and I'm very disappointed in that. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Is, do you want to take a second? No, I'd be delighted to, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that people come. No, it's coming out of your time, so. I understand. I've missed lunch a lot of days. <laughs> I think that if, if we want to use uh, the kinds of common sense language that people understand, uh, we should just do that. We should say, can you bring down the debt before you balance the budget, before you uh, eliminate the deficit? No. You can't start paying down the debt until you stop adding to it. That's all we mean by primary balance. We're not talking about it being okay. We're just saying that you can't honestly tell people that we can pay down the debt while you're still adding to it. Mr. Young. Mr. Director, thanks so much for being here today. I, I know it's been a, a long morning and early afternoon for you. Uh, very briefly, my focus here in Congress is on sustainability, but it's on sustainable job creation. And in the testimony we received from uh, Bernanke the other day, he indicated that the one thing that really is missing from our policymakers in Washington, the executive branch and Congress alike, is that coherent plan, as he phrased it, and as Moody's recently phrased it, when they downgraded Japan's debt, a coherent plan to deal with, deal with our entitlement programs. That is, that is pointedly absent from this, this budget, this, this roadmap, if you will. Uh, I think that's a dereliction of duty on the part of the president. Now, you have indicated in today's Wall Street Journal, if, if they quoted you correctly, that uh, such proposals to deal with these matters are better left in closed-door settings. Fair enough. Perhaps that, that's the political judgment you make. I actually think we owe it to the American people to own up to them and to treat them like adults. That's what I intend to do. What is, what is our pathway into this meeting? How are we going to begin this conversation? Will a letter be forthcoming? What will the date of that meeting be? Please enlighten us. Congressman, um, I don't believe that's exactly what I said, but uh, what I do believe and what I have said is we put down a plan, which is the president's plan, for how we're going to get to the point where we stop adding to the debt. Uh, we've also said that we need to have an environment where we can work together on these long-term issues and have conversations about things that it's frankly hard to have conversations about. History shows that it's much harder to create an environment where we can have trust and conversations to work on a bipartisan basis than it is to take polarizing positions. We've tried to strike a balance putting a responsible plan out there and also creating an environment for that conversation. We just took the first step yesterday. Congress is going to come forward. You'll write your budget. We will engage. And uh, it's a long process. This is the first step. What's the next step? Well, the next step is uh, you, Congress will write a budget. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you do in your budget and how you reach primary surplus, how you reach deficit reduction if you write down the, bring down the debt. We really do. We think that you'll have ideas that we want to take advantage of, and we look forward to working together. Let's tease out in this remaining minute and a half exactly what concerns, let's, let's narrow down what concerns the President has. People on this, this panel here, at least on this side of the aisle, invite the dialogue, mm -hmm. encourage it with the White House on this. Is it, is it people in his own party that are a barrier? And what might I do as a freshman member of Congress yeah. to create the political space where the President can step up and take a leadership role in these matters. I mean, having worked on bipartisan negotiations from both sides of the street, I was in the Speaker's office when the, uh, with the Democratic Speaker when there was a Republican President and with the Democratic President and Republican Speaker. Um, I can tell you the hardest part of the process is developing the trust where you can talk about the things that you have to do. 
And I think the attempts to characterize this budget in the way that we've done it today are things that I hope people will take a, another look at because this is a serious proposal. I know you don't agree with it. I know that there's things that will be in your budget that we don't agree with. We have to come from those positions to find the middle where we can agree. That's how you reach bipartisan agreement. Well, I would encourage the president, I know he's watching C-SPAN today, um, to, to move forward aggressively on this matter. We are running out of time. We don't know what the optimal debt to GDP ratio is, as, as uh, Bernanke and others have, have testified. And uh, I think we need to very quickly uh, embrace this issue and solve it, as opposed to dancing around it and doing the Potomac two-step. We look forward to working together. We, we, we share the same long-term goal. We may have different ideas about how to get there, and that's what we need to work through together. Mr. Rokita. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, Representative Young, Representative Stutzman, and I come from a state that has a balanced budget. Uh, in fact, we have a AAA bond rating. I uh, haven't raised taxes. And as Secretary of State for the last eight years, I've been running the office on a 1987 budget, unadjusted oh. for inflation. And uh, by, by and large, no one seems to have missed a beat. No one's complaining about lack of services or anything else. Can you imagine if we can have Washington work on 1987 dollars? Hold on, don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there'd be a lot of people who asked where their Social Security check was. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. But we have to get to that because you're right, you've acknowledged here a couple times that we have this pig in the python, uh, the baby boomers you described, uh, getting older and, and, and need their tech and need to do something. And that's, I think, the frustration here is, yeah, we all see that, but where's the leadership? You, know, you mentioned a few times that you're a lawyer. I'm one, too. I feel your pain. <laughs> borrow a quote from your practice. I haven't practiced in a long time. <laughs> uh, but the, the classic basic skills of negotiation dictate that when, when, you, when you're kicking off a process, which you just did yesterday, leadership dictates even that you kick off up here. And it seems that you're right here and saying, okay, you guys fill in the blanks. No, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think w we, we kicked off the process with a comprehensive plan that put an awful lot on the table that is, we think, the best way to deal with the immediate challenges in front of us. And if that's not something that you agree with, we look forward to seeing your plan, and then we work together to find where we can resolve it. So I don't agree with the characterization. Uh, I do agree that, as the President said when he said this is a down payment, there will be issues that we have to deal with beyond this. Um, it, it, and and that those are totally consistent. Okay, so in that regard, then let me ask you some specific things. Uh, there's been a bipartisan agreement. Benny Hoyer, if I'm quoting him correctly, said, Democrats agree that spending cuts are necessary to tackle our deep budget deficit. So we got bipartisan agreement that we got to start uh, cutting spending. Given the reality that spending cuts are coming, has OMB approved any agencies spending in excess of FY10 levels? We're currently operating under a continuing resolution. Under a continuing resolution, we neither can begin or terminate activities. So we've been operating under the terms of something that provide for funding from, in most cases, at FY10 levels. Um, it's an imperfect way to run the government. We should have full year spending bills, um, and there undoubtedly will be complications as we move through the year adjusting these numbers as we go along. But uh, w that we're, we're- How do you advise agencies to prepare to start lowering their budgets? Well, we've advised agencies that they should follow the law. The law is that under a continuing resolution, you do not initiate nor terminate for the programs. For the future. Are you starting to get these agencies acclimated to a culture of spending cuts? I, I think the budget exercise Leadership. we went through to produce this budget was, you know, a transition uh, for many agencies where things that were sacred cows that only grew were frozen or reduced. There are tough decisions in this budget, really tough decisions. And I think there isn't an agency of government that hasn't made those trade-offs. Um, you acknowledge that there's a net excess of 22,000 federal employees under your plan. I'm acknowledging, yeah, I'm acknowledging that, that there is, is, is an increase, which is a very small percentage of the federal workforce to address new activities in this period. In, in Indiana, 22,000 is a lot of people. No, it is a lot of people, but it's a big country, too. So when you put a few uh, people at airports all over the country, it starts to add up. Oh, don't start the airport. No, I could give other examples if I had more time. <laughs> One more quick thing on Social Security. You mm -hmm. mentioned that Social Security wasn't much of an issue. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I want you to tell me whether or not the trust fund is, has any money in it or not. Trust fund has been running a surplus since 1983. That's been taken. And it has bonds in it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stutzman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Liu, for your time today. Um, does the administration have any concern about the, the national debt? Yes. I mean, am I right in reading that in, on page 202 that our debt is going to go from 13.5 trillion to 26.3 trillion over the next 10 years? Yeah, I think that we are very concerned about controlling the deficit so we stop building the national debt. We then have to start bringing down the debt so that the interest payments can also be reduced. But how, I mean, there's no plan or no idea in here that even starts the curve back to some sort of solvency with national debt. I mean, to me, you know, I, I, as we waited for the, the president's budget, I, I really felt that, you know, um, the president was going to come back and he was going to, to um, in this town, I, as a freshman, I'm finding it's very political and I, I see great divides between the party. And I thought maybe the president's going to try to one-up the Republican Party and, and do something that, you know, maybe we're going to try to jump out in front and, and do. And, and it, it totally surprised me to see this type of a budget. As a small business owner back in Indiana, um, to, to project deficit spending, project ma doubling the debt, uh, when, when are we going to start to see some sort of um, action to show otherwise? Well, f first, I mean, you, you're, you're looking at, at, at there are different measures of the debt. The debt held by the public is the part of the debt that has the impact on credit markets. Okay. And um, I, I would just note that well, there are different ways of looking at it. it, doesn't, it, it, it that gets to a much lower number in 2021. Where does it start to, do, do, uh, to go back down? Am I looking at the wrong line? No, it, I mean, until, until we start paying down the debt, the interest payments on the debt will still uh, be increasing that number. So we do, I, I don't disagree that we need to ultimately turn the corner and start paying down the debt. I just am arguing, and I, I think it's common sense, that until we stop adding to the debt through our spending policies, to pay down the old debt is impossible. So we've got to do this in two steps. This down payment has that first step, which is the critical and necessary first step. The only department that I see, and I'm, I'm, as I'm going back through, there's a couple of departments that get minimal increases, but the, it appears the largest increase is to the Department of the Treasury, specifically the IRS. Can you comment why? Well, th there, there are several reasons. First of all, we um, are implementing financial uh, regulatory reform, which uh, is an important uh, area, and we certainly don't want to be exposed to the future um, risks of bailout that we've seen in recent years. Secondly, we have enforcement initiatives where I think we all agree that um, you know two people live next door and they're in the same income tax status, they have the same income, they should pay the same taxes. It shouldn't be that if you cheat, you pay a lower tax rate, and there are enforcement uh, so efforts in there. So how many of the 22,000 new federal employees are anticipated to be hired by the IRS? I'd have to go back and check the, the, the specific numbers. What? Okay, I got a couple of mis miscellaneous questions. How many federal employees do we currently have? Um, I could give you an exact number, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to get back to you. Okay, and then real quick, I think I heard you say earlier that employers' number one concern is that they need an educated workforce, is that right? I said when I meet with CEOs, one of the big concerns that I hear them express is that they have trouble hiring people with the skills they need in science, engineering, and math. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Yep. Uh, Mr. Langford. Thank you. Uh, you got to do this whole exercise last year and uh, go through all the dance and all the hearings and everything else, and then a budget was actually not passed. I've only been here eight weeks on the well, job. So <laughs> as far as this task on it, and so getting a chance to, to do this again and that uh, we can hopefully get a chance to pick up and, and pass a budget this time and get, get us through on that. Uh, I'm hearing a perpetual sense of uh, the certain apocalypse is coming uh, if Republicans actually try to balance the budget and move us from out of just deficit spending to actually cutting down the debt. Uh, but I, I can tell you, I see the other side of this to say $26 trillion is a more frightening thing to me than balancing a budget is a frightening thing to me on that. Um, it, let, let me just set a quick stage for you and just the emotions of that, because you're walking into this early on at this point, uh, returning back as I'm walking into it. Here's the sense that I walk into it with. When I came on January the 5th, this year's budget was pro deficit was projected to be $1.4 trillion. By the State of the Union, it was $1.5 trillion. As of yesterday, it's $1.65 trillion. Now, what I'm hearing is this sense of consternation that we're talking about cutting $100 billion out of this year's budget when actually our deficit has increased $250 billion just in the six weeks 
that we've been in this session at this point. And so there is a real sense among a lot of people that I talk with to say, we cannot just slow down the amount of debt that we're adding each year. We've got to actually get back to balance. And I know you're walking a fine line, and I know you're fulfilling the president's mandate to say, let's slow down the curve somewhat on it. But you go out 10 years, and there is no debt reduction. And I know you said a, a bunch of times, we've got to get back to this primary balance. But it seems as if the next president and the next Congress is left with the hard decisions, and this is just some simple decisions I get into it. And you in, 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 in fairness, the, the President Obama took office and inherited a, a situation that was out of control. And he's we're getting it under control, and right. we're doing it as we emerge from the recession. What, well, what I'm hearing are terms like sustainable deficits. That mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be working towards getting it under control. Mm -hmm. That seems to be working towards getting it to some manageable balance that we only add a trillion or so a year to our debt, and we're not really getting out of this. The other side of it that really concerns me is this whole sense of trying to split up the way that we're handling energy, that there's a preferred energy and there's a non-preferred energy. And we're going to try to sink a lot of money into R&D, into new technologies and energy, while punishing people that are in traditional. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about jobs and about small businesses. And my question, I guess, in multifold in this and my concerns on it, number one is, is an independent producer of traditional energy sources who has three to five employees a small business? Um, I, if that was the entirety of the business, I believe it, it would be a small business. For a lot of independent yeah. producers around the country, yeah. they have three to five employees. And there's this sense of we're going to go hammer on the big oil companies when the majority of our energy companies aren't the big giant companies. They are small independent producers that are scattered all over the country. There's hundreds and thousands of them scattered all over that are about to get hammered that are living in fear that the administration is going to come hammer them to come do another type of energy, very similar to what President Carter did when he said we're going to have 20 percent of our electricity produced by solar power by the year 2000, yet here we are in 2011, it's not even 1 percent. We're seeing that other countries are investing in the technology now and making uh, the technology has advanced and we are entering a different period of time. I, I, I could just respond I, to I, one point that well, you Let me made. just say this. I have no issue with all forms of energy. No, I, hear I have an issue with going and punishing one group that's actually fueling our vehicles and powering our cars and, and getting our homes ready so we can go try to do something else that may work 10 years from now. It feels like the sustainable debt here to say, you know, okay, we'll try to manage this and hopefully that'll work out at some point. That's what I feel like we're doing to energy by trying to punish the energy companies. I, I know we're almost out of time. If I could just go back to one point you were making earlier where you described the increase in the projected deficits. I would just want to point out that in December, I know you weren't here in December, in December, my first couple of weeks in this new position, we had an important bipartisan agreement to do something that I think most of us agree on, which is taxes shouldn't have gone up January 1st of this year. We needed to have the uh, economic activity, and it was the wrong time it, it, to, to let a tax increase take place. And we also needed to do some things because we were still in a recession. That's driving up the numbers, but we knew when we passed it at the time that it would have that short-term impact. Thank you. Mr. Ginto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Liu, for being here. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions, and I'll try to um, not take up the, the full four minutes. First of all, I understand earlier this morning we agreed on the $1.6 trillion deficit number for FY012 as proposed, correct? I'm not sure I understand what you're referring to. D did you did you agree that this budget proposal has a $1.6 trillion deficit? I mean, we, we, our, our budget uh, states in its four corners what the, what the deficit is uh, each year, and um, I'm happy to... 2012, it's $1.6 trillion. Correct. Um, in 2012, it's 1.1. 1.1 trillion. Okay. You you had said uh, that we want to cut the deficit in half as it relates to GDP. You had also made statements about the deficit as a percentage of GDP. You also said that we need to be talking more clearly to the country uh, about the challenges we have. I, I don't disagree with that. M my point would be I don't think the country appreciates the verbiage that we use. Municipalities, states, and homes do not budget the way the federal government budgets. I agree with you, and I think most people here agree that we do have to reform and reduce spending. We do have to get on a path to reduce, uh, to, to have a, a greater fiscal uh, soundness moving forward. I, I don't see that path in this budget. You've, you've conveyed that this is a first step. Um, you've also made the statement that we need to put the step on the brakes at the right time. I believe that the country believes this is the time. Our time is now in order to change course, change direction. And I am certainly willing to work with, with you and anybody 
who recognizes that point. I don't see it in the budget, uh, and maybe I, I'm missing it, but I'll continue to look, look through. A couple of things that I would consider, um, first of all, I I'd like to know how many programs for this budget did the administration audit? Um, how many did we audit? We reviewed every program in the federal government. Um, we have terminations, reductions, and savings in t over 200. In, in this budget mm -hmm. proposal? Okay, do you know how much money that saves? 33 billion. The, those 200 uh, plus uh, terminations, reductions, and savings save over $33 billion in 12. And where did you end up spending that savings in this proposal? Um, you know, we, we are, we are uh, living within the freeze. Uh, we are uh, paying for the, the, the uh, extension of the Medicare uh, doc fix. We're doing, there's a whole host of things. So in, in just a few seconds, I, it would be hard to, to give you the complete comprehensive answer. Is, is there a proposal for a reduction in force of, of federal employees? There's not a, a, a general policy. Um, I believe there are some agencies that may well have some reductions in force. It's not that it was a government-wide policy. But you could instruct the departments to, to reduce the size and scope of their... Right. I mean, we, we have uh, a pay freeze, which is a reduction in compensation for, for federal workers. And we have budgets that are very constrained, which mean that uh, they're going to take on new missions without new people. And uh, I, I think these are very tight budgets for federal agencies. Okay. Uh, and the final point I, I'd like to make is uh, in New Hampshire, my home state, 94% of our employers are small business owners. Um, I note on the OMB website that uh, you project over 10 years, 500,000 new jobs will be created in New Hampshire. Our, our total population is about 1.3 million. Um, I, I fail to see how we're going to create 500,000 new jobs in, the, in my state, particularly when yeah. we've got um, the uh, – marginal rate lapsing at 45% with the number of small business owners we have. Um, well, I'm not familiar with the, the specific projection you're referring to. I'm happy to take a look at it and get back okay. to you. Thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> thank you very I think, much. I hope you get some time to eat lunch before your next hearing. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming by. We obviously have a chasm that separates our, our opinions on these issues. Uh, I look forward to uh, further meetings with you in, in the future. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.